Uh, good evening and welcome to the Township of South Orange Village Planning Board special meeting for Monday, August 18th, 2014. Uh, Jetta, will you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Colton Max. Here. Mr. Lerner. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. Ms. Harris. Here. And Mr. Lerman. Here. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, the Village's website, and the South Orange Maplewood News Record, and by filing said notice in the office of the Village Clerk. Uh, there is only one item on tonight's agenda, application to be heard, case number 238, South Orange Rescue Squad, Block 1906, Lot 2, 62 Sloan Street. Minor site plan and C variance. The applicant is seeking to construct a new two-story South Orange Rescue Squad facility on an existing parking lot with rescue vehicle parking. And uh, I think that the applicant is represented by council. And please go ahead. Mr. Chairman, good evening. Good to be here. Uh, Rob Simon from Herald Law on behalf of the applicant, South Orange uh, Rescue Squad. Uh, the application tonight is indeed for minor site plan approval together with uh, some C variances. As you are all aware, this property is in the um, Central uh, Business District Redevelopment Zone. And as per the redevelopment law, as part of the process to, to build in a redevelopment zone, the quote unquote applicant is required to go in before a planning board for site plan approval as well as in South Orange for any other variances that are required. Uh, so this evening, uh, what we believe are variances uh, that require some proofs are for an undersized lot, uh, for a minimum rear yard setback, 25 feet required, 5.8 feet proposed, and maximum lot coverage, 90% required, and 95.5% uh, proposed. I believe uh, you mean 91.5% 91 91 proposed, excuse me. And uh, so with that, we will uh, present three witnesses tonight. We have Dan Cohn, a representative of the applicant who will uh, briefly walk us through the intended operations. We have Mario Ianelli of Dewberry, the engineer on the project, who's going to walk us through the engineering and the site plan ap application portions for the site, as well as Robbie Conley, the architect on the project, who's going to present testimony as to building design and elevations. And each witness will provide information, of course, pertaining to the variances and the applicable proofs that are required as part of the application. And finally, before we get, begin, we uh, very much want to thank each one of you for taking the time out to uh, make yourself available away from your each of your respective families to attend the special meeting so thank you on behalf of the rescue squad our pleasure. so with that i'd like to call dan cohen as my first witness you can go right to the right of me dan all right please raise your right hand do you swear or affirm the testimony that you'll give to this board is the whole truth? I do. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Dan Cohen. My address is 35 Jessica Way in South Orange. And uh, Dan, for how long have you been living in South Orange? Uh, I've lived in South Orange and Maplewood my whole life. I've lived at this address for eight years, and I've been a member of the rescue squad for 22 years, 23 years actually now. And what is your current position with the rescue squad? I'm um, the captain. And if you can just briefly describe why we're here tonight, the nature of the, uh, the application, including the proposed use of the, the building that the rescue squad seeks to construct. Sure. Um, also, before I do, I also want to thank you all for uh, having this special meeting. We appreciate it. I know it's not a scheduled thing, and it is the middle of August. Uh, the rescue squad, I won't get into the whole history, but we've been around since 1952. Uh, we were located on Third and Valley for uh, since I believe 1970 or 69 when that building was built. We've been displaced now by the Third and Valley Redevelopment Project and uh, evicted and the original intent was for the builder of that project to incorporate the rescue squad in the Third and Valley Project but somewhere along the line they changed their mind and decided to uh, give a monetary donation instead to have the rescue squad relocated off-site. They being the redeveloper. They being the redeveloper, the uh, Jonathan Rose, who was uh, redeveloping the Third and Valley lot. Um, the Township Board of Trustees at some point uh, in the past year decided that uh, this was really, we're a private nonprofit 501c3 organization, even though we do provide services to the town. Jonathan Rose is a private developer, so the township decided to kind of get out of the way and, and uh, allow 
Jonathan Rose to donate the money to us for us to build our new headquarters off-site. So uh, that's where we are now. The, the old building that was in Third and Valley uh, was pretty much beyond its useful life anyway. It was constructed in 1970, like I said, when the squad was much different, we were much smaller. We were not a live-in squad. People didn't stay there overnight. Uh, they just responded from home or work when there was a call. Now we're a bigger operation with more ambulances. Um, we staff seven nights a week overnight with crews sleeping in the building, so we, our needs are a little different anyway. So it, it worked out that we needed a new building anyway, and the town's been telling us to hold off because they knew Third and Valley was coming. We wanted to expand, I think, going back 10 years. Um, but now with the Third and Valley project and us getting displaced, there, there's a reason to, to build a new building. So again, for the board's edification, Dan, if you can just describe where are you right now and what the current facilities are like okay. currently. Uh, right now we're in a rented uh, one bedroom apartment on 4th Street, which is owned by a construction company and we share their garage with the construction company and all their construction equipment. Uh, we're making it work. It's not the best situation. It's not the best living conditions, but uh, it is what it is. And uh, you know, our members are doing a very good job of, uh, you know, basing our operations there, but would be eager to move on to a, a new real building. And in terms of the, the particular location, this was not a location that the rescue squad actually went out and searched as if you were a private developer, but rather a, a site that the uh, municipality decided would be appropriate for your use. Right. When Jonathan Rose, uh, the developer from Third and Valley, changed their plans to not build our building, um, the township at first was going to build it or going to be in charge of it. They looked around, looked at some sites. They picked the Sloan Street site. I believe they were also looking at a Second Street, uh, but there was concern about future redevelopment on Second Street. So uh, the town picked the site, and then when we took the project over, that was already assigned. Uh, the town owns that site now. It's a parking lot. They agreed to uh, a long-term lease to lease it to us, I believe, for a dollar or, or maybe sell it to us for a dollar. I don't know the specifications. Okay. And the plans, as you're aware, the plans and specifications and elevations have been submitted to this board as part of the application. Um, if you would just, and we're going to have the architect and the engineer obviously go through that testimony, but in particular with regard to the the floor plan itself if you can just describe you know what the intended use is of let's say the multi-purpose room versus the conference room etc okay uh, the multi-purpose room is uh, kind of like it says multi-purpose we use it uh, or the one we had in our old building we use for trainings for meetings for members of the public come in and we do CPR classes first aid classes uh, all of our trainings we train the police department in there too on CPR um, but it's also kind of the place where the crews hang out when there's not a call and they're not sleeping, um, you know, and uh, gather kind of a, you know, a room where, where everybody congregates when it's not being used for training. And what about for the conference room? That's The conference upstairs. room is uh, upstairs and that is used for our board of directors or any meetings where we would need privacy and that's one thing that will be a benefit of this building. Our old building uh, didn't have that, so we just had the one multi-purpose room. If there were board meetings, members of the rescue squad who were not on the board would have to sit outside uh, in the parking lot. And same thing if we have any uh, interviews or things of a confidential nature with, with members' meetings uh, in the past, other members would have to vacate the building because there's nowhere else to go. Uh, but now we'll have a dedicated conference room just for that. And in, in terms of your quote-unquote intended operations, you stated, Dan, that you operate obviously seven days a week. If you can just maybe just go into a little bit of detail as to how the uh, rescue squad is staffed, how many members, how many are on at one time, where do they come from if there is uh, an emergency call? Sure. Um, Monday through Friday, we staff a crew at the building from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m., Saturday and Sunday, it's 24 hours. Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., uh, Monarch, a private company, has an ambulance, one crew that they station in town. 
a uh, number of years ago we made the decision that uh, we wanted to be a live-in squad to help with response times and make sure people weren't waiting for an ambulance so we said that a dedicated crew would always be with an ambulance 24 hours a day um, it got to a point where we couldn't always guarantee a dedicated crew from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. during the week because people have jobs and work uh, so there are definitely crews available but they're not with the ambulance so during the week Monday through Friday during the days we answer calls uh, I think we did three of them today but those are backups we back up uh, the Monarch crew in town and we back up Maplewood fire department um, so members are coming from work or from home the 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. and 24 hours a day on the weekends there's always one dedicated crew at the building living there staying there with the ambulances and we also provide backup with second and third crews who come from home and, and how many uh, volunteers per crew uh, we have it's a minimum of two per call uh, but we have right now every crew staff with four members and currently how many uh, volunteers are part of the South Orange Rescue Squad approximately 40 so if you have let's say let's say today you had three calls so how many volunteers are, are actively involved at a time typically each ambulance crew is between two and four people um, if it's the regular duty crew like I said right now our crews are assigned with four because um, we've got a lot of new members who are getting on board but uh, today they were backup calls during the day and they had two people so there was two people answering those calls per crew um, if there are a lot calls going on and we have a lot of members I mean it can be from anywhere from two per ambulance so that would be six if we have all three ambulances out up to four per ambulance which would be 12 but usually it's about six to ten if we have all three going at once and with regard to services that would be provided in the building for those who are not affiliated with the rescue squad like for example if you had a class or something I think you alluded to um, just describe for the benefit of the board what your what your expectation is in terms of use of the building uh, I mean the building would mostly be used to to house us but we do offer classes to the public CPR and first aid classes um, like I said we also we just finished training the South Orange Police Department in CPR they came in in groups of 10 until we had all of them trained and we trained the counselors for the Baird camp and CPR and that sort of thing so we do uh, offer classes people can come down on the weekends and would have usually about 10 to 12 people at a time for three to four hours uh, but mostly it houses the the crews that respond to calls and this one final question at this point Dan um, can you even estimate or guesstimate how many calls the rescue squad uh, attends to over the course of let's say a, a year in the last number of years sure uh, last year we had 1300 and this year I think we're on track to hit between uh, 1500 and 1700 calls so far I haven't added up the totals but we're about a third over what we were at last year and and those calls are, are primarily for uh, South Orange residents and also obviously something happening in South Orange Village yes we do also like I said we back up uh, Maplewood so we're in Maplewood uh, quite frequently but most of our calls are South Orange I have no further questions for Mr. Cohen at this point okay members of the board any questions yes Michael yes captain uh, you mentioned two to four people Michael. per shift Michael um, two to four people per shift uh, what about dispatch do you have somebody stationed there permanently for dispatch our dispatch is off-site uh, we are currently dispatched by Union County dispatching uh, that's changing to a company called Rams which is in Newark but basically when a call comes in 911 call comes into the police department they dispatch a police car and they have a one-button transfer where they transfer to medical dispatchers and then they page us out or contact us uh, on the reason radio. I asked the question is on the plan it shows it looks like a space for dispatch yeah we have um, a dispatch room but it's more a communications room um, so it's a combo room yeah communications and how many and you say at minimum on, on a typical shift how many people do you have I know you said two to four per ambulance right on a typical shift stationed at the building it's 
two to four people, usually four. Right now, our, our, all of our crews are full with four people on it. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because parking is not on site. Parking is striped on the street with seven spaces. So if you happen to have two four-man four crews, unless they're sharing cars, they're going to have to park in the municipal lot or some other place. Right. We're, uh, we had been speaking with the village about trying to find additional parking in the, in the lot behind, but I believe they have six spaces for us. So for the every night, the actual duty crew will have room to park, and if there uh, are additional crews coming down, yeah, they would have to find spaces within the municipal parking around the lot. But we are fortunate to be in the downtown area where there is a parking around the building. Okay, this question may be more apropos to the architect, but based on your foreseeable future, your five-year plan or mm -hmm. whatever you're looking out into the future, will this facility as it is presently designed hold you for five or ten years? Yes, we think it will. And we definitely had wanted a bigger lot and more space, uh, but I think uh, that Robbie, the architect who you'll speak with, did a pretty amazing job of, of getting everything that we need into this uh, into the space and maximizing the space of it. Um, yeah. Any other questions from the members? Any questions from the professionals? No? Okay. Thank you for coming and testifying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Cohn. So with that, I'd like to call uh, Mario Ionelli, the uh, architect on the project. Mr. Ionelli, if you would start with giving your uh, name, Mr. occupation. Mr. Ionelli, oh. would you please raise your right hand? Sorry. Thank you. Mario, Mr. do you swear or affirm this testimony that you give this board is the whole truth? Yes. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Mario Ionelli. My address is 600 Parsippany Road, Parsippany, New Jersey. Mr. Ionelli, if you would uh, start by providing the board with your occupation, affiliation, areas of expertise and licenses in the field, please. Uh, yes, I'm the manager of land development services at Dewberry. Uh, I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. I received my degree in civil engineering from NGIT in 1993 and my master's in 2001. I've been a licensed practicing civil engineer uh, since 1993 and been licensed, I'm sorry, since 1999. And you've testified, Mr. Ionelli, before zoning and planning boards in the past? Yes, uh, including this one. Okay. And at those times, were you, uh, throughout, throughout the state of New Jersey, correct? Yes. And at those times, were you qualified as an expert witness as a civil engineer? Yes. Okay. I'd ask that Mr. Ionelli be uh, deemed as an expert in the area of engineering. Any objection? No. Yes. Accepted. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Objected. <laughs> Accepted, yes. not objected. Only if yes. you want us to. Yes. We could have watched Aaron for a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, Mr. Ionelli, uh, you participated in um, creating the uh, site plan for this application, correct? Yes. Okay. And you're familiar with the property and the surrounding neighborhood? Yes. Okay. Do you want to start by marking anything that we have not submitted to the board? Yes. Uh, the only thing I, hear, I have here that has not been submitted is an aerial. Uh, I want to mark it with A1. A1, please. So Mr. Ionelli, if you can start by just providing the board with an overview Excuse of the, the site and the surrounding Excuse area. Mr. Simon, yes. Mr. Ionelli, could you please describe for us what A1 is? Yes, I will. Uh, A1 is an aerial that's showing uh, the site highlighted right in the center and the surrounding area. Uh, the aerial is taken from uh, the state website for uh, it's the GeoWeb website. Um, and the purpose of the exhibit is to show the site itself and the uh, adjacent land uses and the proximity to other land uses such as the uh, Third and Valley development. And that's a recent uh, photo. Yes. So if you would provide, just based on your um, referencing A1, just an overview of the area. Okay. Yeah, I'm just highlighting here. I know it's difficult for you to see because it's a little far away. Um, this is the rail line. Sloan is running adjacent to. Can you please uh, either take the microphone with you or face the microphone when you're speaking? It's not registered. 
Okay. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Um, the site, like I said, is located just to uh, the south of the existing firehouse uh, on Sloan, which I'm highlighting. Third Street, the parking lot shown in this area is uh, pre-construction as it was uh, when the existing or the prior uh, first day squad was located, and I'm highlighting that on the map. Um, there is also a municipal parking lot located to the rear of the site on 2nd Street, so I wanted to give an idea of the proximity. Um, and basically what you can see is the proposed site is relatively close to the former site, mm -hmm. um, and it is relatively close to the surrounding parking that's available uh, through public parking. And if you would just identify on A1, Mr. Ionelli, where the uh, seven proposed uh, parking spots on Sloan Street are going to be? Basically, there are six drop-off spaces out there right now. There's there no parking drop-off only. Actually, I'll refer to the easel next to it, the C102, which is in your packet, mm -hmm. um, which is the layout plan. You can see here, to get you oriented, this is the before, Mr. Ionelli, before you continue in referencing the, the plan, can you just get, provide a date of that, of the plan, last revision date? Sure. It was, uh, the date on the plan says uh, July 11, 2014, uh, but this was the plan that was submitted um, to address the completeness items. And, and sheet, what sheet number is it? Uh, sheet C-102. Okay, please continue. Thank you. Um, so what you see here, and I'm highlighting on C-102, is the proposed building shaded on the existing lot. This is Sloan Street running in front of it, and across Sloan Street there's like a gore that is a, into the sidewalk that creates a parking lane. Currently there is a striped no parking, uh, like a drop-off activity that occurs there. We're proposing to create seven parallel parking stalls along the road on uh, basically the northwest side of Sloan. Um, that would give them a, at least seven spaces that are very close to the, pro uh, to the uh, proposed squad place. And again, there is additional parking located um, around on 2nd Street that is public parking. And with regard to this application, just taking a step back for a second, the, the properties immediately surrounding it, as well as this property, are all located within the, the redevelopment area, correct? The Central Business District Redevelopment Area, that is correct. And, and as part of this application for, for minor site plan, uh, a number of variances, bulk variances, are, are required. If you can just briefly go over those. Yes. Um, the minimum lot size is um, 6,000 square feet. The existing lot size is 4,633. That's a pre-existing condition. Um, the minimum rear yard is 25 feet. We're proposing 5.8 feet. Because of the tightness of the site, uh, we really try to stay as far off the, um, the rear yard as possible, but the front also had to be set based on the, uh, the necessary distance from uh, to be able to pull out of the rescue squad with the proposed garages and the uh, exiting vehicles. So between the programming that had to happen within the building and the ability for the proximity to the street and the limited lot area, we really had no choice but to, to request this variance. And the depth of the, the proposed lot is only approximately 58 feet. That is correct. Okay. And there's also a variance required for maximum lot coverage. That correct? is correct. 90% is what is permitted. We are proposing 91.5%. That really t uh, goes back to the same issue of we really don't have a lot of room on site. Whatever we didn't have to pave, we did not. Uh, we tried putting some planters out in front. Uh, we did uh, propose some green area, but its space is very limited. And with regard to a parking requirement that, that would be applicable for this uh, central business district redevelopment zone. The redevelopment plan basically refers you back into the zoning ordinance to determine the applicable parking requirement for the particular use, correct? That is correct. And in, in the zoning ordinance, there, there is no specific designation for number of spaces based on this proposed rescue squad use, correct? 
That is correct. So therefore, you then go to kind of plan B, which is you look at the square footage of the property and you determine the number of parking spaces required based on the gross square feet of the building, correct? That is correct. And normally, uh, there's actually a range provided at the lowest end where parking is required is from 5,000 to 10,000 square feet. Our building actually falls below that standard. So actually, it's, it falls under the standard of may not even have to provide parking like a storefront on the downtown. Um, so, because your understanding is from talking to the architect that the, the calculated uh, gross f floor area is 4,951 square feet. That is correct. But assuming for the moment that, because Mr. it's pretty Mr. close Mr. to. Mr. Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Simon. I think that, that information is first being provided to us now, right? How many square feet is it? It, it is 4,900. The architect will get into that, but just for purposes of just discussing the parking. 4,000. Four nine five one. Yes, sir. Okay. So, based on the ordinance requirement, that would fall below the five thousand square foot gross square foot threshold, not requiring any parking. Technical. That's correct. But assuming to be conservative, that in fact the building was approximately five thousand square feet, based on the calculation of uh, one space per eight hundred square feet of gross floor area, that comes out to approximately seven spaces that would be required. It comes out. Exact number 6.2 rounded up to seven. Okay. And the, so the, as part of this application, while the rescue squad can't physically fit any parking spaces on site, other than for the three, the three bays for the uh, rescue squad uh, vehicles, that the proposal is to have the seven spaces across on Sloan Street. That is correct. And in addition to which that the, both in the redevelopment plan and also in the ordinance, uh, your understanding in reviewing the uh, the ordinance is that this board has the discretion to to relax any applicable uh, parking standard in this particular area should that they see fit. That is my understanding. And you're also familiar with the the redevelopment project on on, on Valley and Third, correct? Yes, I was the uh, I'm the engineer of record for the site design. Okay. And as part of that uh, development plan. Uh, there is a proposal to have a abundant number of parking spaces via a parking garage for that project, correct? Yeah, there's a parking garage that's going up with 529 spaces. Uh, actually, we drove by it today. It's amazing. It's coming out of the ground. Um, and 265 of those were dedicated to commuters, and uh, 264 were to residents uh, th for the proposed building. Uh, what that means is that you're adding roughly, from what was there at 189 spaces, you're adding roughly 76 spaces to the Sloan Street area for new commuter parking with the Third and Valley development. Um, and if you look at what we're losing as part of this, we are losing 12 spaces in the lot that uh, obviously we have to construct the building on the lot. So 12 spaces would be removed. So you're still looking at, between the, I mean, between the both projects, you're still looking at a net gain in that area of roughly 64 spaces. Um, these projects, in my opinion, are linked because, you know, one project had to be moved to facilitate the other. So um, that's why the parking, in my opinion, should look, be looked at a little globally. And globally to also include the surrounding that's parking that's, that's currently available. Now, you've had an opportunity to review the, uh, the Omelette Engineering Report dated August 1st as well as the uh, Higher Gruel Report dated August 13th? Yes. And I know we've, uh, we've addressed many of those items via correspondence as part of completeness, but if you would just maybe address a couple of the items that I'm going to just mention right now uh, that come to mind. Uh, number one, the, uh, the maintenance of the grass in the rear yard area. Um, we'll be more than happy to change. The rear yard area that they're referring to is when you to get yourself oriented, when the, the building itself is a shaded area, the front will be concrete with a concrete sidewalk that wraps around the northern side and wraps around to two doors in the back of the building. There's, there's a small area, uh, roughly six by, uh, six by 20, that we were proposing grass in an attempt to put some landscaping, but there was a concern about maintenance. So we can put a river rock treatment in the back that would you know, have a reg, uh, like a weed blanket, so that way there's a lot less maintenance associated with it. Um, that would be, a, 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 I think, a reasonable solution without, I don't want to pave it. So that's kind of an in-between. And on your uh, site plan, as most recently submitted, you uh, provide for some uh, proposed mm -hmm. landscaping. Can you just kind of go over that for, yes. the, for the board? Yes. Mr. 
Mr. Ionelli, if you can just refer to what uh, sheet number yeah. you're, you're uh, referencing and the, the date of the, the last revision date. Um, sheet C-104, um, last revised August 6, 2014. Um, this is... Uh, Basically, we're proposing, again, to get you oriented, the building is shaded. We're proposing five seasonal planters in front of the bump out to try to add some color to the front of the building. We're pro providing some uh, small <coughs> landscaping. We have to be cognizant that we have, you know, overhead wires, so we're trying to plant something that will be reasonable in the area. And then in the rear, we're looking to put, that's what we called out for turf grass. We're, proposing to eliminate that, like I just mentioned, to go to a river rock and, and a weed uh, barrier so to minimize the ma uh, maintenance. Uh, really, whatever we didn't pay, we tried to put something um, of some kind of, gr uh, some kind of greenery, and we also provided some of the, uh, some additional opportunity to put some color in front of the building with the planters. And with regard to the um, Omlin report, uh, the, I just want to address the, just the, even just the first item about the relocation of the, uh, of the street light. Uh, yes. Um, basically, to facilitate the driveway in front of the building, we have to relocate one of the street lights. Um, our, our proposal is to put it in the, um, the grass area behind the sidewalk, and there is an overhead line that was pointed out. We, in the last revised plans, we just shifted it. We're going to have to make some judgment calls. We're out there, but we should be clear of that overhead line by just shifting it slightly. So that I don't envision a problem at all. Uh, but where it was shown originally, it was actually in conflict with the, uh, with the overhead. And with regard to uh, item 9 of the Omlin uh, review dated August 1st, in terms of a construction schedule. Uh, in talking with representatives of the squad, uh, Basically, they're looking to break ground this fall, and they're looking to open up in the summer. So that's the goal. They're hoping for a good winter. And then I, I believe most of those other items either we provide or will be provided. Uh, the information will be provided through the testimony of the architect. Just one item from the, uh, the higher grill report having to do uh, with the recommendation to, to put a bike rack somewhere on the site. If you can just address that recommendation, please. Um, there really is no... The front of the building is predominantly three bays, um, and you have a small area where we're off the property line where the bump out is, we're proposing the planters. This is not, there's not a large area like on the side of the building outside of vehicular traffic. I would not recommend promoting any kind of uh, parking of bikes because commuters are going to use that potentially, which I'm not against that, but in this location with emergency responders going in and out, I don't think it's a good idea. And there's opportunities across the way for... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, if you look at the building, the building is as wide as the lot for the most part, minus mm -hmm. five feet. So you have, you know, really little opportunity to put one in front of the building that doesn't potentially conflict with a vehicle. And then fi finally, Mr. Ionelli, I know you're not a, uh, a professional planner, but you have, on I'm sure many occasions, uh, provided factual testimony based on your experience as a professional engineer as to the various criteria that are required for for bulk variance relief in particular maybe not necessarily a d variance but certainly for a c variance mm -hmm. correct that is correct okay and then just generally if you would just um you understand that as part of the negative criteria that needs to be proven by the application uh, there not needs to not be shown any substantial detriment to the public to the surrounding area or detriment, substantial detriment to the to the ordinance, and I and I I'm just asking you from a professional engineering perspective, and m more uh, significantly based on your experience, not only with this project but also with the uh, Third and Valley project that's r right down the street there, or whether you see any any detriment to the to the surrounding area from an engineering perspective. I would consider these variances de minimis from an engineering perspective, it, it, considering the constraints that we have, with the lot being the size that it is the building having the requirements it needs um, for to facilitate what they need within the building, they're relatively de minimis. I mean, when you look at the scheme of things, uh, the, the coverage is re really close to what's required. The rear yard setback is really being driven by the undersized lot 
and the fact that they need to fit a certain size building on the building. So I don't see any overall detriment to by it to the. It, it's really a situation where these are. They are, these are un almost unavoidable on this particular lot for this particular use, and I don't really see a problem with them from an engineering perspective. Okay. I have no further questions for Mr. Ionelli at this time. Just questions for the board. Okay, thank you. Members of the board? Michael? Yes. Good evening. Uh, the seven spots that uh, you contemplate for uh, across the street uh, for parking for rescue squad uh, workers and uh, first responders, are they displacing existing spots that are now for commuters? Mm -hmm. Right now they're not spaces. You're not allowed to park there, but they are a drop-off. They're okay. not, they're, there's, I, I've been out there numerous times and um, I've been out, I, I can't say I've been out there as much as you because you live here, but I've been out there numerous times to see how the activity, I've not seen too many cars there, maybe two, three max. Um, but there is a drop-off activity that does occur there. Is it, isn't there a bus stop or more than one bus stop there? That's further down That's on Sloan. That's closer to the Third and Valley development. Okay. There are striped spaces here. We're not, we, we, you got to understand we're squeezed between that very bus stop and the yellow curb that's in front of the fire department for, so people, they can swing out their vehicles. So it's really limited to where we can go. Will the, these spots interfere with the ambulances? coming out no we looked at turning radiuses for uh, a single unit 30-foot truck to pull out which is probably larger than most of the vehicles that will be coming out of here and these are sized uh, with the 9 by 20 9 by 18s what are these I think they're 9 by 20s. 22 you need to you need to use the microphone I'm sorry come back the scale I believe they're 9 by 22 There's, and there's no hydrants there that presently that are, uh, exist in these lo this location? Not on the survey, not that I recall either. Okay. No, no. All right, thank you. Other questions from members of the board? Yes. Well, hold on. Let me get the members first. No, I don't have questions. Questions. Just as a follow up to Michael's question. The drop-off spaces were put there to try and alleviate the drop-off at the crosswalk by the train station and get people to pull past it. So my question maybe is more to the town than to you. Um, what are they going to do to supplant those spaces and where are they going to consider a drop-off to try and ease people double parking literally right by that crosswalk, which is forcing cars around it? Uh, you may not be able to answer that, and I don't know if that's been under discussion at all. But aside from that, just just some questions. Are any are there? And I'll answer. Ask this mainly for one of our members who was not here. Are are there any green elements of the building that you're proposing? There's no green elements really to the site that we're proposing. This is a pretty de minimis site. It doesn't even meet major development by the standards of DEP. Um, and there's really no opportunity, I mean, to infiltrate any storm water. There's really no opportunity to do anything like that. If anything, we're actually, if, if you look at the runoff from the site now, currently, I it's do. currently paved with vehicular traffic. We're going to roof. That actually is a, uh, the DEP considers roof water clean. So in theory, we are providing by land cover, changing the land cover. The runoff will be about volume-wise the same, but it actually will meet the standard of, of clean storm water runoff from the DEP standard. So while we're not doing it because of a limited site, there are certain elements that we have by default in, incorporated into the design. Okay, just, just, I have a number of questions, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. No, please. Uh, your question. I know you're going to have a generator, but I don't see anywhere on the plans where you're showing a generator pad or locations for any mechanical equipment. I believe the architect will testify later that there is no generator planned at this time, but that five foot strip in the back, if they decide to put a generator, a six foot wide strip, this is a relatively small building. The generator that will be required is relatively small. Um, but 
right now there are no generators in plans for uh well there is I, i'm sorry but i understand the town already has a grant approved for a generator for this building well that's all right so I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be a generator here michael and, well, we if you look at if you look at uh c103 yeah i didn't see that. if you look at c103 right by where the uh, entrance is on the on the I never tell directions, but on the side of the property, yeah. there is actually an area with an arrow drawn to it which says future generator location, subject to necessary permits and coordination. C103? Oh, yeah. I missed it. Okay. This is that, that's in that grass area, I guess. Yeah. Right here. That's in that rip area. Yeah, that's going to be if okay. they decide to do it, it'll be in the stone area in the back. Um, and, and where is the other mechanical equipment? Somebody else want to address that? Uh, yes, the architect will address that. They're on the roof. Okay, so no, you're, no, not, you're not addressing the architecture no, at this point. They are actually going to be ground units. They're going to be typical residential units. This was something I just spoke to them about uh, prior to the meeting. And um, they're going to be relatively small residential type units. Uh, he'll describe the units. And right now, the only place we have for them is in that same area. Okay, all okay, right, well. So, the, the architecture. So you're not you're, you're not talking uh, you're not talking about the architectural or ADA requirements or you're not addressing anything. Nothing you're just, with the art. The you're building addressing itself. In the engineering. I'm talking about the site itself. Okay, the site itself on the southwest side. Um, there's there's a building, and there's a fence, a wooden fence, and there's some trees that are growing up. Are those trees on whose property? Is it on can, this can, site or is uh, it the neighbor's property? About the rear property. No, no, I think, no, he's, he's talking about the, uh, the south. On the site where you're going to have a blank wall. Right. Okay. You, go, or there's a demo plan. You, need the, Wait. you need the microphone. Okay. They start giving us signals from the back if I don't yeah, tell you right. that, so. It was just hard to tell from the plans as to whether, uh, visiting the site, I know there's a fence there, and obviously on your photographs it shows there's a fence, but I don't know whose property that fences on or where the trees grow out from and I was just wondering if, if that's on this site that's going to be demolished or it's on the adjacent property okay I got sheet C101 which is the demolition plan just provide a date for that, Mr. Ryan. Uh, same date, 7 11 2014. Okay. That was me. No, that's, no. <laughs> that's me. Um, there are three trees noted on that side to come down. Um, what we have to obviously investigate if there's trees leaning over, they might have to be trimmed back. Um, but that's the trees on other people's property. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, the property line goes straight up. So there's going to have to be some trimming of some of those trees for sure. Yeah, it was just hard on a personal visit to see whether they're on this piece of property or on the neighbor's property. Well, a survey located the three on our site. Those are coming down. And then we're going to have to obviously address some of the trees that are growing over the property line with some trimming. Well, more for the architect, I believe, than for uh, the engineer. Adam, any questions? No. Nope. Lillian? No. I, I, I do have, excuse me, I do have three sets of questions for you, um, very briefly. Um, one is to get back to the parking question. Um, was there, to your knowledge, and I don't know, maybe Adam, you're in a better position to address this, but the first thing is just a comment. We, I, I feel the obligation to make it every meeting. Everybody who comes before us double and triple counts the, count, the parking that's available. Everybody counts that parking. Right. And there's parking that we're losing that was already there in addition to what was just there for the rescue squad. So I, I'm not quibbling per se. I'm just saying that unfortunately we hear that about the parking a lot and the reality is a little different. Um, but I was just sort of curious if, if uh, because you made this comment and it sort of struck a chord with me, you said that um, you look at the projects as connected, and certainly during the development phase, I get that. I'm not so sure afterwards because the parking, because there's no direct relationship. I'm just curious if it was ever discussed 
whether or not there was the possibility of having a reserve parking space or two for the members of the rescue squad in the Third and Valley development uh, parking. My understanding with the um, Third and the, the rescue squad is going to approach not all, about securing some spaces beyond the seven. The location, I don't know where that is, whether it's a parking lot in the back or it's the deck. I think that would be more I, of a question what's more suitable for them. You know. I, I just I, I think that perhaps the Jonathan Rose companies is the redeveloper that was talking about including it within their space. The rescue squad's uh, uh, new headquarters would have perhaps a special uh, obligation or, or uh, desire to help out. So that's why. Adam, do you know if that was ever discussed or thought about? I don't think that was discussed, but I, I'll, I don't think it would be part of these discussions anyway. No, yeah. it would not. I was just oh, curious, yeah. and I would recommend that perhaps if there's ongoing discussions, perhaps something to think about. I'll leave it at that. Second question has to do with variances. There is obviously, um, there are two variances that I can't see any possibility of being mitigated in any way. The 25 uh, yard setback or 25 foot setback is just too much, you know, there's not enough space in order to deal with that. And obviously you have a pre-existing condition of lot size. I don't expect you to go out and acquire other land to mitigate that. However, I do have a question about lot coverage. Mm -hmm. You're at 91.5% when 90% is the thing. So I'm just sort of curious. So first of all, it's just a basic math question. In order to get within that 90%, you'd have to reduce it by 1.5%. What would a reduction of 1.5% be in square footage? 1.5%? Uh, based on the uh, ground floor footprint, be about 45 square feet. Based no, on the uh, if, it's, if the lot, if the lot size is 4663 times 0 0.015, it's about uh, 70 square feet. And I, I just, I just want to hear myself ask this question. You cannot see a way, and I'm not talking about reducing the size of the building. I'm really thinking about reducing the size of perhaps the amount of area that has to be paved. There's no way to reduce that. I tried, square feet. and let me tr explain to you how I tried. There's a sidewalk that's proposed around the building. You need to keep the microphone. Sound like a broken record, but. No. Um, so there's a sidewalk that's proposed around the building. Originally, there's doors in the back for egress requirements, and I wanted to try to put a pad there and eliminate the sidewalk connecting it. That would have gotten us under, and it was just not something in parts. Uh, there's, they, they need full access around the building to the, to the various doors. So anything that didn't require pavement, we didn't pave. And there's no way, I just, to hear myself ask the question, there's no way to move those doors down by some number of feet that would allow you, like, I mean, I guess maybe the architect has to ask that question, but if those doors were moved back towards, uh, uh, what is that? Well, I don't know where it should be. Well, put that in perspective. That would have to be moved close to 10, more than 10 feet to get the 70, because a five foot wide sidewalk. So I, you could, I don't think it can be done because there's stairwells and such, but I'll let the architect talk about that. Okay. And then the, the final thing about the bike rack, um, that's, I know something that the town has passed an ordinance on. I know it's important to the town and the question gets asked literally at every meeting because of that. Um, the, the area that was supposed to be for uh, grass and you're now talking about having Riverstone, could that, could you not potentially look at putting a bike rack back in that area? The problem is, is that there's a small little knee wall because yeah, the, the, the site goes up in no access. Topo. So the site from the front to the back, so the, you, I actually have to create a little depressed area to meet the finished floor in the back. So this area is actually, hot. you're going to have to go over a little wall to get to the bike rack then. And it wouldn't, it, it's, not, it's not at the same level. You're, you're a foot or so, foot and a half lower, or higher, I should say, in that gravel area. Okay. All I right. challenged it because I knew it was an issue, and I just could not find it. Okay. All right, I don't have any other questions. If there are no other questions from the board members, I'll move on to our professionals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Ionelli, the proposed change from lawn to the River Rock, 
would it be fair to say that that could be considered impervious coverage i i know some people consider gravel impervious coverage um, <coughs> when gravel is in a landscaped area that does not have vehicular loading on it it doesn't compact actually the gravel back there will be more porous and allow more water to infiltrate than grass would uh, because you're not driving on it gravel that you drive on gets pancaked and hardened then it almost becomes a pavement this is not the situation this is going to be a river rock that's going to probably have a a better absorption rate than grass sal is is there anything that speaks to this in the town ordinance um yeah the ordinance does uh, recognize certain materials as porous materials um there was an amendment to the ordinance a few years back that gives credit so if uh, if it is a porous material it can be treated that way um but to that point that same area the question is the pads for the equipment that may go back there is, are those pads included in the lot coverage calculation because those are going to be on concrete pads which is not the generator was included but the units were not but remember those small units go into any runoff that does come off a four by four concrete pad that into goes into a uh, uh, a gravel area it's going to get absorbed so while it has to be adjusted ever so slightly and almost unmeasurable I mean these, these units are rather small like residential <coughs> units it is really a situation where we have no other choice where to put it we wanted to put a dry originally we wanted to have a drywall on site and <laughs> there's no place to put it I, it's just a it's just a question I think the question was whether or not it changed the percentage and the answer is uh, it does if only by a small amount would that be a fair restatement that's correct uh, if you could put the drywall underneath the riprap why not Wait, wait, wait. The, the, you got to say, if you're going to shake your head, you have to uh, say no. I'm letting him finish. I, I will. <laughs> um, I thought he wasn't done. Oh, um, the, it's too close to the building. Normal rules by DEP standards, you want at least, you know, 10 feet from a drywall to a building. You don't want it right up against a building. Okay. I would agree. Um, in town, when people are required to put in drywall systems, you know, uh, on their property, we always recommend a minimum of 10 feet from the foundation uh, because otherwise uh, if there's well, there's no basement in this building but you know, the water just basically circulates back because the foundation is you've disturbed the natural soil and that's a natural place for that water to go okay. so you want to drive well as far away as possible I'm sorry I need to interrupt you just one second it, but and I was looking by the way at where the generator is located the generator looks like it's immediately adjacent to the exterior wall is that correct Am I was I looking at that correctly Yes, yes. Because like, isn't there isn't there a rule or aren't there uh, certain rules about there has to be a certain amount of distance between the? I, I have my own generators. Why I, why I ask the question? So I think there has to be a few feet, doesn't there? There isn't a uh, local ordinance that I'm aware of that requires any setback requirements. Okay. Um, I don't know okay. if, if there is a building code issue regarding that, but typically the manufacturer of the generator will establish what the required setback ought to be. So depending on the on the generator model, mm -hmm. um, the way it operates, um, that would determine how far from the building it should be. Uh, on the generac, on that. the generac, 20 kV, 20 kVs, it's about a foot to a foot and a half from the building <laughs> recommended by generac. Right, and, and that, that pad would just slide off. The gravel will go around it. We don't we don't have the spec on it yet, but there are certain. I've seen uh, generators go almost up against the building with their own enclosures. You know what I mean? It just depends on what. Kind providing of there's no window there. Right. Within. It, right. <laughs> but that's why the, the, it's shown as a location, and it needs to be su and it's subject to review depending on what they go. With. Sorry. Please that's go ahead. Uh, second question, Mr. Ionelli. <clears throat> Currently, are there driveway encroachments from the adjacent lot onto this parcel yes there is and was that impervious coverage counted or included in your impervious coverage yes calculation for the site yes it was all impervious coverage within our lot line was included okay uh, and then my last question was uh, the back end of comment number nine in our august 1st memorandum uh, regarding staging <clears throat> are you going to be able to maintain all of the construction activities and staging on the site during construction or will there be need at some point to secure additional areas on adjacent parcels 
That is a interesting question because it's basically the building is the size of the property. And when you, I'm thinking about parking for construction vehicles, what I would recommend is allow us to put a staging plan together of uh, some sort, a basic staging plan, and we can work that out uh, because we have not gotten that far into the planning process, but obviously it's something needs to be addressed um, for not only the equipment, but the parking, equipment storage, um, things of that nature. I have no, for, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. That's a major okay, question. any questions from our planner? <coughs> uh, no, okay, uh, council, any questions? Uh, Mr. Ionelli, I know you're not a professional planner, but I understand the applicant is not presenting one, correct? That's correct. So are you able to give any testimony about whether or not the benefits of the proposed variances outweigh the detriments? I'm able to speak to the fact that we're looking to provide an essential service to the community that needs to be relocated. Uh, it's currently in a location that's not suitable. Um, the lot itself was provided to the rescue squad, so there was very little opportunity to avoid these variances. And when you look at the type of use that is being proposed, comparing those to the variances that are being requested, uh, I go back to my earlier statement that I really believe they're rather de minimis compared to you know what your uh, what ultimately will be here a new facility, state of the art, uh, for years to come for your rescue squad. So. I honestly can say that the, the benefit is that part of it and, and the, the negative is very little uh, to, your, to your zoning ordinance. It really has no impact, in my opinion. It's an existing non-conforming lot with constraints beyond um, something we can accommodate in, with good planning. Patrick, any other questions? Mm. Can I, so so can I assess one more? Um, as a follow-up, as a follow-up to Mr. Dwyer's question, uh, Mr. Ionelli, you're familiar with uh, the concept of inherently beneficial use yes. in, in in zoning. That there's certain uses that, under the municipal land use law, are are deemed inherently beneficial, and as a result, they satisfy the quote-unquote positive criteria for any variance uh, request as part of an application. Yes, I am. And and you understand that the hospitals and schools are are inherently beneficial use by definition. That, yes, I do. Okay, and would you consider the rescue squad use also as inherently beneficial use? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Just, yes, Mike, just as a follow-up to the staging question, because it, first of all, I don't think anyone on this panel is, is against the rescue squad. I mean, let's just get put that out clear. But let's just talk about the staging question. I mean, we saw the Bifus site where that was approved. They had a stage literally partially on the street. Here you're on a fairly busy street on a com in a commuter way. I, I think you really have to address the staging issues and where you're going to park things. Your vehicles, your, your excavating equipment. Initially, you can park some of it on site, but once you start moving and moving the whole site, there is no room. It's all building, so you, somebody's got to address that. And I, I'm surprised that hasn't been addressed to date. I don't think, though, it's it's under our purview in particular. Am I am I wrong? Well, I'm not so sure it isn't. Uh, it's not necessarily a zoning issue. It certainly is going to be a construction issue. Right. Oh, no, absolutely. They will have it is, to deal with it. It is something it, that the, the applicant is going to have to coordinate mm -hmm. right. with the village yes. um, for you know, not just storage, but also for you know possibly traffic control, things like that. Um, there's going to be times, especially when the front apron is done, um, when the front of the building is done, that area of the sidewalk is most likely going to be closed off for a period of time, so there's going to have to, we have to redirect commuters to the other side of the street. Um, those are all things that would have to be worked out with the village. As far as staging is concerned as well, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the parking lot on 2nd Street, um, the additional parking lot that was added. We do have plans to increase the size of that lot um, and create, I believe, another 12 spaces in that parking. Um, and I. I know that there have been discussions about possibly using some of those spaces for, you know, squad members um, that you know um, that you know can park there a long period of time. The other um, the, the, sp the spaces on the street, as my understanding has been, is that the, those are used for the squad members that you know need to come right away. They need they need those spaces, you know, when they're mm -hmm. when they're responding. 
um, and that's why those spaces were, were um, scheduled to be set aside okay. for this one. Michael, is that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Sal, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah. No. Okay, um, I, I did not follow proper protocol with our first uh, person because we were supposed to actually open it to questions from the public. Uh, so at this time, uh, at least for our current witness, uh, I now am going to open it to any questions from members of the public. Okay, hearing none. Um, I, I assume that uh, I, I'll just ask to make up for my previous error. Uh, if Mr. Cohen, if there were any questions for you, I assume you'd be willing to take them. Are there any questions for Mr. Cohen at this time? Okay. Thank you for your perseverance. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, do you have any other witnesses? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to call uh, Robbie Conley, the architect on the project, please. Mr. Ionelli, um, may I request that you um, try and update the lot coverage numbers before we're done tonight, if that's at all possible, so that if we were to try to incorporate the proper variance into, an a into a resolution, that we could do so with the proper updated numbers. You don't have to do it right now as we're speaking, but just if you could do it while you're out. Okay, I can do it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you swear or affirm? I don't know your name. Was, uh, uh, Robert Conley. Mr. Connolly, do you swear or affirm the testimony that you'll give this board is the whole truth? Yes, I do. State your name and address for the record. Uh, Robbie J. Conley, 596 Glassboro Road, Woodbury Heights, New Jersey. Thank you. Mr. Connolly, would you provide uh, for the board your occupation, affiliation, areas of expertise, and licenses? Uh, I'm an architect uh, licensed in the state of New Jersey uh, and owner and uh, principal architect of Robbie Connolly Architect LLC. Uh, I'm a graduate of Drexel University. I've been in business now for 14 years and been in the architectural field for over 25 years. And you've appeared before zoning and planning boards in the state of New Jersey on yes. behalf of applications. And in particular, you've appeared before zoning and planning boards with regard to rescue squad applications, correct? Yes, we have. Okay. And during those occasions, were you so qualified as an expert in the field of architecture? Yes, I am. Okay. I would ask that Mr. Connolly be qualified as an expert in the field of architecture by this board. Any objections? Except it is open. Mr. Connolly, uh, your office prepared the plans and elevations uh, incident to this application, correct? That is correct. And you're familiar with the property in the surrounding neighborhood? Yes, I am. Okay. If you can just provide an overview for the benefit of the board of your architectural elevations and plans and just provide a, sure. a walkthrough in terms of... In, 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 uh, okay. um, basically, we have here uh, A1, which was submitted with the package that you have. Um, would you like me to? If you can uh, just identify in terms of A1, the date of that. A1, dated August plan. 7th, 2014, with a renovation on. Uh, revision? Revision, August 7th, 2014. Go ahead. Um, and also. And that actually uh, was submitted with it's, uh, yeah, We're not going to mark it unless the board likes us, want us, wants us to. Excuse me. Oh, let's, and let's also, we have a uh, rendering here of the building that was not submitted with the package. If you would like to, yeah, we're going to mark, mark that, that as, as A2. So, why don't you mark that as A2, sure. please? Yeah, and Mr. Connolly, if you could just describe what A2 is. Sure, A2 is an artist's rendition of what we uh, expect the building to look like when completed. Okay, and it's uh, substantially similar to the architectural plans and elevations you submitted as part of this application? Yes, it is. Okay. All right, please continue. Okay. Um, basically, on your A1, we have the first floor plan, uh, which is the three bays for the squads, the uh, meeting room, multi-purpose room. Uh, there is a dispatch slash office area, a toilet facility, sprinkler room, some medical storage, and a janitor's closet and decon area, and some other storage. Up on the second floor, we have a conference area, storage room, mechanical room, two bunk rooms, and two toilet rooms, and a small little sitting area in the front. 
and that's basically what we have for the building. Okay. And um, in your um, being qualified, Mr. Connolly, uh, you mentioned that you have participated in putting together plans for other rescue squads. Yes, we, uh, Robbie Connolly Architect LLC is one of the, uh, we specialize in emergency service buildings. We've worked for over 48, uh, I guess now it's 50, uh, emergency service organizations, fire, police, and EMS. I myself was an EMT for 23 years. I've been a volunteer firefighter for 32 the past 10 as the uh, chief of a uh, fire department that also has an ambulance involved in it. And what struck me when we originally spoke about this application is that in all of these uh, rescue squad and, and responder projects you've done, you stated that this site might, might be the tightest. Yeah, I think this is the tightest. And I just realized when we were out there listening to the other testimony that probably the one that this beat, I brought a photograph of that building to show you the sign, but we can get to that later. So if you would go through with regard to uh, A1, uh, the various ele elevations. Okay, on the front elevation, uh, you can see here we have the three overhead doors. One of the things that we try to do when we're designing our buildings is uh, we try to make it fit the neighborhood in some way, shape, or form. A lot of times these buildings are in residential areas. And one of the things that we do in residential areas is we'll make the building, the uh, windows a little bit bigger so the overhead doors look a little bit smaller. Um, here, because it's, it does have residential on one side, well, we weren't as concerned about that in the front, but we did want to somehow address the firehouse. So if you look on the elevation on the front, we do have the tower element here to kind of tie it in. Uh, we're gonna be using architectural block on the outside of the building. And we're looking at on the bottom will be an architectural block that's more of a sandstone color to kind of pick up some of the colors from the firehouse. And on the upper portion of the building, even though it's going to be architectural block, we're going to do a red, reddish color block so it looks a little bit more like brick and it will fit in a little bit more. And at least we're pulling some cues off of the existing building next door. Uh, so as you go around to the building, we also have a little bit of a step back, uh, which was both aesthetical and also for uh, functional. Across the front of the building, we have two bays that sit out to the front. Then we have one bay that actually sits back a little bit further. One of the reasons we pulled that bay back a little bit further was so they would actually be able to pull a vehicle out in front of that bay and hopefully not hang out into the street. So if they're washing their vehicle or they have some maintenance that they have to do, they can pull any one of the vehicles in front of this bay and it won't be hanging out into the street. So there's a little bit more space there. So again, this is also why this building was pushed further to the back, so we could get a little bit more space in the front so they could do the maintenance and they could pull the vehicles out there without them hanging out into the street. Um, so as you go around to the side of the building, which is actually this side, there are a yeah, couple when, of different- when, I'm sorry, Mr. Connolly, when you're referring to this side of the building, you're talking elevation about- Elevation B. Elevation B, uh, which, which is uh, facing which way? which is facing the north end. One, one of the things, our buildings always start in the front A, we go counter or clockwise around the building. So you're, if you're standing at the front is A, B, C, D as you go around. Something we picked up in emergency service and we just carry it through with our buildings. So, 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 so elevation B is facing the firehouse. It's facing the firehouse. And that we, we step back a little bit there and I believe on the site there's a five foot walkway in that area. Um, so we did hold the building back off of that line a little bit. Uh, that's also where we have the access into the stairs and the access around to the back of the building if that's necessary. Uh, on the rear of the building and on that side there, there is one door but there's no windows on that side of the building facing the police department. On the back of the building you'll see there are some windows there. We have the door to the sprinkler room, a door out of their uh, multi-purpose room and a couple windows into the multi-purpose room. And we did pick up and play with the roof a little bit back there to make it so it wasn't as plain as um, it, it could have been. Um, and as that's the rear of the building. As we go around to the other side, which faces the residential neighborhood. That's, the, that's elevation D on uh, A1 of your plan? Yes. Um, that side there, because we're right on the property line, and this is a downtown building and the property, the neighborhood property could build up to the property line also, uh, there's no windows or anything on that side of the building. Uh, there will be a little bit of an uh, adjustment in the block where the bottom, the block will actually be about four inches bigger, and as it comes up, there will be a little 
a water table there that cuts it back into a eight inch block. So you have 12 inch, then eight inch. It's actually for uh, cost of construction, but also gives us an architectural element there. So, um, and you can see that here where it wraps around here and it wraps around that side of the building. It does not wrap around the back. So it wraps around both sides, but not the rear of the building. Mr. Connolly, there was some uh, comment in, in the higher gruel uh, report, the most recent one, regarding the signage and the size and the illumination of the signage. If you can just address that, maybe initially referring to A2. Sure. If you look here, this is the sign that was addressed in that. What that is, is that's a rear lit uh, wall mounted sign. It's not a neon sign. Uh, the light, it's, it's installed a couple inches off of the building so the light spills around the sign and then we'll light up the ladders which are sur surface mounted on the front of the building. So. Do you mean like a halo type? Kind of like a halo system? type. If, if you actually want to see uh, what the sign looks like, I only brought 10 copies with me, uh, but I could pass these around, which are photographs which of the Spring Lake First Aid Squad which has the same sign on it. Unfortunately, the photograph is during the day, so you can't see the light spilling out around it, but it is I'm the gonna, same sign. I'm going to sure. mark this as, as A3. And then, Mr. Conley, if you can just describe what, what A3 is before as we pass okay. it out. A A3 is actually a copy of a uh, photograph and a data sheet on the Spring Lake First Aid Squad building, which has a similar Star of Life sign on the front of the building as what we are planning uh, to build here on this building. And, and, and Mr. Connolly, there was a question about the, the size of the sign and whether variance relief would be required based on the uh, overall square footage of the sign. If you can just uh, address that, please. Okay. Um, the overall, the, it looks like when the planner took the square footage of the sign, they looked at this all as being one sign this all as being one sign and measured it that way. Uh, it basically what it is, it's two different elements. It's <laughs> separate letters that are mounted onto the face of the building, and then it is a wall sign that is also mounted to the face. So if you take the calculation on all of that, and I have another uh, 25 sets of a sign detail that I can hand out to you, that shows that we are actually under that square footage, uh, substantially under if you actually just take the square footage of the sign itself, of the Star of Life itself. Uh, but even if we look at the Star of Life as a box and the two arcs of lettering as boxes, we're still under the 90. Okay. So why don't we mark as A4 for identification a plan sheet that was created in direct response to the higher guru yes. letter and that the issue that was raised as to the size of the sign. So as they're, Mr. Conley, as they're being handed out, I'm going to show you what's been marked as A4 for identification. If you can just identify what this is, including the date, please. And, and this is a sign detail that was created today, August 18th, 2014, and it is uh, also numbered A1. Um, and basically it's a detail of the sign showing the size of the letters, which will be nine inch high letters of a block type that are mounted directly to the surface of the building. And then the six foot 11 and a quarter by seven foot six star of life, uh, which is mounted a couple of inches off of the building and is basically a box wall sign lit from behind and then the light spills out in a halo effect from the outside of the, or from the back of the sign. So, so given the dimensions and the measurements uh, that, that you've done with regard to this particular sign and as reflected on A4 that you've just handed out, is it your uh, professional opinion that the proposed signage falls within the requirements set forth in the uh, municipal ordinance? Yes, it is. If you take, like I said earlier, the arcs of the letters and you box them in, they are together uh, 30 or uh, 20 square feet. And if you take the Star of Life itself and just the sign area, it's about 32, which would give us only 52 square feet of signage. And if you take the box of the Star of Life, rather than cutting out each corner, we're only about 75 square feet. 
in the in the higher grill report there was a reference to a, a need for a design waiver regarding the requirement the design requirement in the redevelopment plan specifically that exterior walls shall not be large blank uh, expanses and it's a reference specifically to the southern wall which is the elevation D which is facing the uh, the residential uh, property and whether the fact that that's a blank wall whether that meets the requirements uh, set forth in the redevelopment plan uh, and their sp and the specific design standards so if you can address that please sure um, because we're building uh, a downtown area and we're building right to the property line uh, by code we can't have any windows in that wall uh, we do have you know the difference of material we'll have a a different color block down the bottom We'll move up into a, uh, the field block will be probably like a red brickish color. And then we have the stucco at the top. We do have some change there, but there's nothing to do there other than we have to have a big blank wall because we can't have windows and we're building right on the property line. And, and of course, as you've already heard, there's no other space to move away from that property line. So, Sir, may I ask you a question? I understand you can't have operative windows, but you certainly can put in faux windows. We could put in faux windows. Um, I mean, we're also on an extremely tight budget uh, trying to get I, this I'm building I'm ignoring up, costs so. for the moment. So. Um, in my opinion, faux windows, uh, I don't know that they really do what you're looking for. You're looking for this side of the building to not look like a plain. I, I think the architectural block is a, is a pretty material, and I think it'll look good on there. And if we were to inset windows and make it look like windows were there, um, could we do it? I guess we could if we really had to, but it's also a uh, type one seismic building, so that's gonna play into our shear walls. This is the one shear wall, which is a structural element that's needed in seismic buildings, and that's the one shear wall that we have in the whole building. So uh, that's also tying the building together, structural point of view. There was a comment, Mr. Connolly, regarding uh, the location of the windowsills and how far out they can be from the uh, from the building face. Yes, address uh, that. And I was a little confused on that. I mean, the windows that we have on there, we'll address the whole window issue. Uh, these are aluminum clad wood windows, um, and they are uh, the windows that we're specifying are by Marvin, which are historically accepted windows in most uh, historical areas. And they have a window sill that sits out about two inches, the piece of the aluminum. But if you're looking for like cast stone sills and cast stone headers, um, that's not what we were looking at in the character of this building. Uh, we are looking at concealed headers and lintels on the building and just the window sill of the window itself. Uh, these are more what we call uh, punched windows than having the the fake trim around the building and the fake trim around the windows we're trying to keep it the structure is what the structure is and what you see there was a question asked I believe by Mr. Miller regarding the, the mechanicals incident to the building yes and I think well, Mr. Mr. Ionelli uh, deferred to you yeah we we have three uh, HVAC units that are going to be in the building uh, the units are basically similar to your residential unit it's a furnace for the heat and an air conditioning unit you have your air handling unit inside the building similar to you have in the house you have a condensing unit that sits outside similar to your house so what we have is two of those that are similar to what you have in the house the third unit is just for this uh, front office area and that's going to be more of like a they call it a suitcase condensing unit it almost looks like an attache case it's not that big it's only about a, a foot or so wide and about two foot high and three foot long and where's that going to be? And they're all going to be in the rear of the building okay. back in this area, in this kind of pit like area back in the back. Since you have up uh, A1, you have a uh, kind of a detail in the middle regarding the, uh, the proposed lighting fixture. If you just want to address that, please. Sure. The lighting fixtures that we're putting on the building are more or less accent lighting on the building. They're similar to a residential uh, coach light with a 60 watt bulb in it something similar to what every house has on the front of their house. It's that sort of a light fixture. Uh, because we don't have a huge lot to light up, we're not worrying about lighting up the lot. We're just worrying about putting some lights on the building so you can see as you're getting in and out the doors and the same thing with the overhead doors. 
it's not going to be uh, uh, brightly lit up. And we also feel that there's enough lighting from the street light out front, the lights that are in the, uh, the parking lot behind us, and the lights that are on the firehouse, that the outside of this building is going to be lit up enough. You heard the testimony from Mr. Ionelli and Mr. Connolly regarding the, the question as to whether the, the doors could be moved to. Yeah, the, the, I was looking at that, and we've moved that door as far over to that side as we possibly can, and that's your second means of egress out of that multi-purpose room. So there's no other way of moving that door any further to that side of the building. So we can't move that further. I guess that's north. Yes. Uh, we can't move that any further to the north. That's as far as we can get it in that room. And I believe uh, with that, we've probably hit between uh, the testimony and the correspondence, the, the questions that were in the comments set forth in the Omlin report dated August 1st, 2014. Let me, let me just ask you that you're familiar as part of this project being in the redevelopment area with the Central Business District Redevelopment Plan. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and you're um, aware that this uh, has been considered a permitted use in the zone, and, but you still need to comply with the design standards that are set forth in the, in the redevelopment plan. And do you believe, as based on your testimony as a professional architect, whether uh, this proposed architectural design meets those standards and why? Yeah, yes, I do feel that it does. It's, um, you know, one, one of the things with this building and with the design standards is uh, trying to really address the neighborhood. And we think that, you know, you look in that neighborhood and the first thing you see, the biggest thing you see is the firehouse. And we really think that this has addressed the firehouse. And we have tried to keep the residential character on the other side with the windows, our residential size, the residential type windows. Uh, so even though there's only three residential homes along second, uh, that we've tried to uh, address those homes also. And you believe that uh, given the architectural elements in the surrounding area, namely the, uh, the firehouse, that this uh, proposed design fits in well with that uh, neighboring property and also with the property surrounding it? Yes, I do. Okay. I have nothing further from Mr. Connolly at this point. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Members of the board, uh, any questions for Mr. Connolly? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Connolly. Uh, there seems to be a discrepancy between the rendering. Michael, you might want to take the microphone for yourself. Sorry. There seems to be a discrepancy between the rendering and the, and the plans. Particularly the roof line, the window. Uh, it shows kind of a peak roof in front, but then it seems like that the roof line on the plans comes up almost to the top of the peak of the roof, yet the, plan, the, the, the rendering shows something much, much lower. <laughs> That's because you can't see that roof over there. That roof side, is actually what, what do, over side, here, right there, on this side. Yeah, look where the peak, oh, the, the peak. Of well, again, this is an artistic rendition. It's not exactly what the building is going to be uh, built. So, it's the first time I'm seeing it. You called it as a, as a, as a uh, exhibit. Yes. And it's not in agreement. Uh, furthermore, that the uh, it shows the plan shows stucco. I believe half of the uh, that peak where yes. the sign is and that shows and the, and the rendering does not show that. No, the, the rendering does show stucco. It shows stucco but it's the same color as the block. I'm sorry, I'm far away. Yeah. I, I, so. I can't really tell. Um, it, didn't, it didn't show. Is it, is it possible you could pass that around? The rendering around? Sure. Yes, please. Thanks. So I, just to be clear, the plans are what you're proposing. That is a rendering. It's an artistic rendition sure. of what, yes. Sure. J just to give the board some general idea of what, what the building is going to look like, but not specifically or as detailed as the, exactly. as the plan. Some of the details, that, that rendering was done probably about a month or so ago. And some of the details in working out the heights of the roof and different things have been modified. Um, and they're not necessarily shown on the, the rendering. The rendering we brought more tonight so you can see the character of the materials and the colors and what we were trying to do, which you can't see in the black and white drawings. Well, I guess on that note, just looking at a picture of the firehouse, 
the is it the sand, sandstone you mentioned? The block? It's like a sandstone kind of color, yes. On the firehouse, it seems much lower, and then you have the red brick. Are you going to be mimicking that, or is this something? I mean, are you doing a lot more sandstone, and then? No, we're, the sandstone is about this level, and it jumps up a little bit here at the overhead doors, and then it jumps back down. Okay. Is there a okay. reason you're doing that, or? Yeah. Uh, I mean, was that because, I mean, something on the firehouse that you saw? Or? No, it's just something that the, when we're doing this, what we normally do with the difference between the 12 and the 8 inch block is uh, 8 inch block can only goes so far without being um, restrained by a wall coming into it. Right. And because the overhead doors are so high, we basically come down so far with the 8 inch block and then we go to 12 inch block because of a structural reason. And that's why we have the two different sets. And that's why over here, it's coming up a little bit higher because that's a higher roof. Therefore, we have to bring the 12 inch block up higher to be able to get the structure that we need. Over here, we have a second floor. So the second floor braces the eight inch block so we don't have to bring it. Technically over here, we don't even need the 12 inch block, but we're putting it as an aesthetic element. Okay, and then color will the color of the brick that you're going to be using here match the firehouse? We're going to get as close as we can. We only have certain colors that we can choose from with the architectural block, but they do have a reddish color that uh, looks similar to brick, and that's the color that we will be using. Unfortunately, the rendering and the time of day and the way we were playing with it to try to get the shadows, uh, the time of day it kind of washes out that, that block block color, but it is going to be closer to the firehouse's color. Okay, and then the garage doors, mm -hmm. I'm assuming just, you know, the, you know, using the neighborhood, looking at the firehouse, you have the nice arch doors. I'm assuming the reason you didn't do that was because of cost? Mostly because of cost, right. yes. Is there anything closer in a square garage that mimics kind of the smaller windows that would work, or? I would actually have to look at the firehouse again. Okay. Um, and see if we could make some adjustments with the overhead doors. Okay. Um, which that I'm sure the, uh, the squad wouldn't be opposed to making some changes with the overhead doors. I just, we're limited in the overhead doors, uh, and I don't want to do the little portal like round okay. windows. Um, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's basically what they have now. I don't okay. know if there, if there is a way. Um, it's just, it just looks like those windows just maybe half the size or we might be able to cut these windows down in size and or put a mullion in yeah. that looks like the window is a little bit smaller than that okay so that's something we can definitely look into Great. michael did you have any other questions i, I did actually um, as and to our colleague who isn't here has there been any consideration given uh, to either a lead standard for this or any type of performance standards like Energy Star uh, in, the, in the construction methodology? All of the units and everything that we're putting in are high efficiency units, uh, but we're not looking at any lead certification or any anything specific. Uh, I've found from experience that uh, on a building of this size and this type, you're going to add more cost than the benefit is going to be. So, you know, and going back to architectural elements, when you talked about punch windows, for example, on the turret uh, versus any type of what is shown on the rendering, for example, some type of molding around the windows. Yes, on the on the punch windows or on the uh, turret, we did put a piece of five pond across the top and the bottom to make that look like your your heads and your sills but we only did that to bring the attention to the tower the rest of the windows throughout the building we're not doing that too we're trying to kind of downplay the rest of the windows so okay, and will you also just again uh, it's not right here but uh, will there be some sort of moldings around the garage doors as well yes there is molding around the garage doors uh, that you can see on the drawing there is some sort of a stucco or a, or a fipon or some sort of trim around the doors from the uh, top of the sandstone up and the idea is to try to have that be that same color as the sandstone so it kind of mimics the firehouse that we do have that up and around the overhead doors and on the windows on the tower the stucco that is in the rendering ordinance what was contemplated in terms of the color are you going to match exactly the way that does 
or is it going to be a contrasting color? Who, who is contemplated for the stucco in the front of the building? Are we talking about on the front of the building? I'm talking about on the, the, the apex of the, the, uh, the roof line. Oh, up here? Yes. Uh, we were looking at it to be the same color or to match the block or close to the block color, so it kind of just blends as you're going by. Uh, we weren't looking at that being a contrasting color. Would uh, we be opposed to just continuing the block all the way up? Um, it's something we could look at, but the cost and the structure of running that block up there um, is probably out of the budget of this project, unfortunately. So that's as a budget-driven decision was this done? For the most part, yes, uh, but it's also, if we run the block up there, you have to tie the block in a certain way, and if you don't have a good mason, <laughs> there can be some issues. That's much appreciated. My, my concern is this, this, this building is going to be with the town, with us all, for hopefully many, many years to come. Uh, certainly, there's nobody here questioning the beneficial use of a rescue squad at all. In fact, it's, it's about as beneficial a use as you can come by. And, uh, but from an aesthetic, and when it's putting a rescue squad almost in a, in a, in a downtown area, really, where you know it's questionable as whether that, that's it's, you know putting it right next to Main and Main, where it should go. But the point is, people are going to be walking past it. We have um, commuters going to be looking at it from the train station. We're South Orange is going to be judged in part by the look of this building, by others as well as ourselves. So for me personally. It's really important how this thing looks, particularly in the front. I mean, if you want to try to maybe save some money in the back sides, I don't love the slab sides either, but truly the front, if you're going to put a dollar of, of aesthetic value on it, that's where it should go. And I don't think we should, as a, as a, as a board here, uh, because it's such an important um, use in the town, overlook this because we really are going to be judged. The, the look of this is very, should be important to us. And it's, uh, that's why the, the redevelopment zone has that particular, um, I guess it's the power of uh, some sort of a you know, of, uh, review on that. So that's, that's uh, why I'm questioning the way I am right now. Just, I'm really concerned about how it looks in the front. So that's all. Okay. Um, I mean, it's something we can look at uh, normally. And like I said, I've, I've done a lot of emergency service buildings, uh, similar design similar look, similar materials, and we normally don't take that block all the way up. We normally stop the block at the bearing point, and from that point on, we stucco on top of the roof trusses. Um, it's something we can look at, and we can, yeah, if, it, if it's that important. Michael, any other questions? Thanks. Lily, do you have any questions? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is the Especially with such an elaborate sign, not carrying it up is just going to draw attention to it. So I just wanted to just echo that. Yeah, I, it's, it's 20 foot up in the air. I'm not sure that you're really going to notice the difference. I think people will. Um, I remember the train is right across the street. People. That's true. The, the train is up there. So it's going to be eye level or below many people just who are hanging out. And these are people that are even on the train as well. It will be visible. It, it, it's something we can look at and see. Yeah. We, we can take a look at it and see if we can fit it into the budget. Michael? Yeah, j just to echo some of the comments, I mean, we're building it right next to a fire home house that has just been built. And we're trying to tie it in to look like so it, it's aesthetically matching what the firehouse looks like. Not at the cost of the overruns of the firehouse, but I'm, I'm sure there's things you can do to get it to look closer to the building that's right adjacent to it and what you've got now. B believe me, I, I have about five or six photographs of that firehouse yeah. throughout my office uh, because it is one of the most published firehouses in the state of New Jersey. Um, and I great. really was upset when I didn't get the job to work on the firehouse years ago. But that's Well, we'll give you the tax bill for it. <laughs> I don't remember getting your proposal. Uh, we, we submitted a proposal. Yes. Really? Yeah. Many years ago it was. So, so at any rate. That, oh, that's but a, anyway. <laughs> that, that's a comment I have. I'm just echoing it. I'm not going to repeat it. I am concerned with the sign, and I don't know why you need it that large. I forget whether it's in the, within the ordinance or not, but I don't know why you need something that large on this building and that backlit that's going to stand out pretty bright. I mean. I 
think that you want to advertise that this is the first aid squad building and I don't think personally from advertise an, to who? from an emergency service point of view I don't think it can be big enough but that's besides the point that's all okay. right again I would not be for this size sign I certainly think you can reduce that sign down and still get the effect that you want but let me go on to some other issues is there any design thought on in building for future construction, putting in the elements that would support a second floor? It has a second no, floor. No, it's got a partial second floor. Yes. Is there elements that would consider extending you that? You won't be able to put a second floor in because uh, this area here has to be two stories uh, to fit the, the vehicles in there. So, so it's not designed to handle a second it's floor? It's not designed to handle right, any that's all, additional? That's all no. It's not designed. Now, on the second level, is there a lift to get up to the second level? No, there is not. Do you need AD, meet ADA requirements without uh, a lift? Yes, we do. We meet ADA requirements because all the services that are provided on the second floor are also on uh, how do you get somebody first up? Floor. You don't need to get somebody up. This is a small building. It's less than 10,000 square it's feet. It's not required? Under Therefore, the it doesn't. Well, there's two different things. There's ADA, and then there's the barrier-free subcode. Right. The barrier-free subcode is the code. The ADA is actually a civil piece of legislation. Um, we meet the barrier-free subcode because the building is less than 10,000 square feet and therefore uh, it's not required to have an elevator. As, and we meet ADA because any services that are provided on a non-barrier-free level are provided on a lower level with the exception of the bunk rooms. And the bunk rooms are only for active operating personnel. So again, we meet ADA because ADA has a job description function as part of it, and so there's nobody that could be an active operating EMT running on calls or driving an ambulance if they weren't physically fit to be able to go up and down. What the about steps. for your multi-purpose room where you're going to have meetings and outside people in there and so forth? That's on the first floor, and that's okay. that's uh, part of the area that it's is the accessible. It's the conference room. A conference room, okay. Yeah, the, the conference room. I'm going to leave that to the engineer, engineers to, to wrestle with the, that. The, the conference room um, would be also this front area here is an office, and if there's any meetings, this area here is also their meeting room. So. That's, that's all I have, really. Adam, any questions? Yes. Um, before I move on to our professionals, um, I just have uh, I just have one question, sort of to um, well, it's going to sound strange, build off of what Michael uh, was just asking about. I thought he was going to ask this question, but he didn't. He asked about what about building out the second floor. We heard uh, from uh, Mr. Cohen that uh, you know we, we've heard from from everybody how constrained the space is mm -hmm. in terms of the dimensions of the site. And we certainly heard about a desire, perhaps sometime down the line, to expand. So that you can't expand out, is it possible at some point in the future to expand up, is my question. Uh, they could go up higher and put a full second floor over top of the whole thing, uh, but that would be substantial, um, substantial changes. Is there anything that, I mean, look, obviously you have to build the building for today because okay, you don't know if any of this will ever come to pass. But is there any way to build what you're building for today but leaving yourself flexibility for the possibility that you might need to expand at some point in the future by adding, you know, more of a second floor or even a third floor over where there is a second floor? I, I really think from at least from my experience, and like I said, I've been in the emergency services for 32 years, um, where your expansion would be, would be in your number of vehicles, and there's no way to expand the number of vehicles in this building. Your expansion sure. of your services and the meeting rooms and the sleeping rooms and all of those facilities, I can't ever see having three vehicles okay. in here needing to expand them beyond what you have in this building. Okay. Um, sorry, I do have one other question. Um, relating to um, Elevation D, 
um, the part that faces the residential area the closest to your, yeah. Um, he, the, the question was raised about what could be done to break up the wall, and there was discussion about putting on bow windows. I guess my question would be, what about putting on something that isn't um, a change to the building, but almost off the building? Meaning, just to pick an example, a trellis that you could put something onto. A I mean, the reason, I, the reason I'm saying this is that, yes, there could be a building at some point built next door to it, but for the moment, it's, it, there isn't, and it's, the, you know, our goal, just like we asked, just like I had to ask before about whether or not there's anything to get rid of the possibility of one of the variances, we really have an obligation. I mean, we're a body that is, you know, at, we're being asked to make exceptions to what a governing body has put forward. And in this case, is another exception because the rule is pretty clear that it's not supposed to be as it's being presented understanding that you did point out the differences in the color of the block. So again, I'm trying to come up with a feature that allows us to say that we are um, comporting with what the intent was here, um, but that is, but does not defeat the purpose by, uh, of your project, either by uh, increasing your cost considerably or by undermining other potential features you talked about, you know, the wall in terms of seismic features. So I'm trying to figure out if there's any other way we can be a little bit more creative to come up with some, I mean, I'm not, you know, not suggesting a mural contest or anything like that, but is there any way that we could come up with a, with something that allows us to break up that wall, um, uh, you know, as opposed to what's there now, which is, you know, clearly just one one of the things is, uh, I actually stopped by the site just to look at that side. And there are multiple trees in the backyard of that neighbor and right up in this front corner. There are some that are along our property. I think there's three or four of them that are actually along our property. And I'm assuming that the fence that's there is the property line. On the other side of that, there looks like there's an apple tree there's a couple other trees in this area where I really don't even think you're going to see the side of that building when you drive by. But if there was an issue, I mean, putting trellises and maybe putting some uh, climbing uh, plants there, I think that's something that could be done. The only problem with that is the maintenance of the, the building because yeah. the climbing plants can a lot of times grab a hold of the building and can start pulling through the, the mortar, et cetera. So I'm not sure that that would be the best answer either. Um, I, I really, I don't know what the best answer is other than you know, hoping somebody builds something else there really quick. Okay. All right, those, thank you. Those are my questions. Um, do our uh, professionals have any questions? Please proceed. Yeah. First, a clarification about the signage. You went to and provided this, which is uh, rather elaborate in measuring all the specifics of the sign, but the village has a very specific definition of measuring the sign, which is the smallest rectangle that encompasses the entirety of the sign. And I don't have a scale with me, and you didn't provide the full dimension of the size of the sign. So, just for clarification purposes, can you tell me what? The overall height is the sign, the overall width of the sign, and how many square feet. That when you say the sign, are you talking about the lettering also? The bill specifically says. Okay, that because the, the way I look at it is it's two separate things. But well, it, I, I see it as separate things also, but the definition of sign measurement does specifically include the letters, include the graphic, small rectangle, and encompasses it. Okay, it is. Uh, that They're was not connected. And it, it looks to me like you're about uh, 10 or 11 feet high from the bottom. It, it's the about 10 by area. 10. It's approximately 10 by 10. Okay, so that would be 100 square feet. So, correct. And my calculations were, I think, about 95 square feet is what is permitted by... I believe so, yes, so Some, somewhere. square feet per linear footage of yes. footage, which you have like 63. So I was saying that technically, for more than 95 square feet, by that definition of the smallest rectangle, you would need the variance. So if you want to measure quickly, you are under that, actually. So it looks like it might be maybe 10 by 9, and you're only at 90 square feet. Uh, we can actually adjust it a couple of inches and get under the requirement of the 95 square feet if we needed to. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And we'll, we'll commit to do that as a condition of approval. I mean, I, I really think I'm looking at this, and we have the sign is seven foot, this, the, what I call the sign, the logo. The star belief itself is about seven foot six by seven foot. Um, I would say that we can probably cut that down to maybe six by six, or maybe, you know, approximately six by six, and possibly shrink the letters down a little bit, and I think that that might satisfy making that star life a little bit smaller and making the whole thing a little bit smaller for you. That was my only question to clarify the science population. Okay. Does our engineer have any questions? Uh, just to follow to the plan, um, Mr. Conley, on the uh, exhibit that you passed out, which is the Spring Lake First Aid Emergency The A3? Yes, the A3. Um, That star of light looks like it's about six foot tall. You figure those overhead doors that are on there are two, four, six, eight, twelve foot. So it's about half of one of the overhead doors. Now, I think you have to make sure your button isn't pushed. Is it pushed on there? On now. <laughs> <laughs> and the Spring Lake frontage, is this building about the same size as the current proposal? I'm sorry, what was that? Is the building the, approximately the same the size as the current is this proposal? Is about the same size? Uh, yes, it's about the same size. Uh, it just goes towards proportion. You know, if this is about the same size as, as the proposed building, you know, if, if the board feels that this sign is appropriate, <clears throat> then, you know, it, it's a good guideline, I think, for what would be appropriate on this first aid squad. I mean, it's not like this is a destination where I really need a big sign because I have to go to the first aid squad. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Hey. Uh, Chris, uh, our planner already asked the question I had. Okay. Sal? Um, the, the question I have is regarding the, um, I guess, we're looking at elevation A, uh, there's an eave on the uh, roof here that it extends out. Yes. Okay, and the, um, according to the site plan, there's only a six inch setback Correct. in the foundation. I just want to make sure that the roof is not going to extend. Um, no, basically there's a six inch setback at the foundation and then the wall, the face of the wall drops back another four inches. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 10 inches and the overhang there is only about eight inches. Okay, I just wanted to be sure of that. Can, can, can I ask Mr. Conley just a question that came to mind? Um, I just want to make sure Sal was done. Yes. Okay, yes, then please. Uh, just to address the question that was asked earlier about the, the staging for construction, I know, Mr. Conley, I know you're not uh, an engineer, but in your experience, your vast experience working for rescue squads and participating on behalf of rescue squads, do you have any experience or can you opine as to maybe some suggestions regarding the staging for this site? Yeah, I mean, actually, um, there, there's most of these buildings that we've done before, especially those that are on tight sites, um, and those that we've constructed next to existing buildings. Uh, what they do is they come in and they put in their footings and foundations first, bring their block up out of the ground, then they pour the slabs for the floor, and then most of the staging and most of the work comes out of those engine bays as they build up. They build the building up as a shell for the most part, all the way up, get it enclosed, then they'll bring the floor trusses inside and drop them in the joist hangers. And so the majority of the work on the building, once you get up out of the ground and you get the floor slab poured, is all staged and done from the inside of the building. Um, the only things that I can see being an issue here uh, would be one, yes, some of the construction vehicles are gonna probably have to find parking in the area, um, which is, you know, most downtown construction is like that. Uh, the only time that I see that the road would have to be closed or there wouldn't be any issues with traffic would be when they are setting the roof trusses. 
um, and quite possibly, I'm not sure if they'd be able to use the parking lot behind or not to do that, uh, but that would be something that, that's the only issue that I see when they're pulling the crane up and they're setting the roof trusses is the only time that I see there being a major problem other than just having additional cars that need to be parked down there. Because most of the storage of materials and most of the work is going to be done from the middle of the building out. Once they get up and they get the shell done, most of their uh, storage of materials and everything is done inside uh, because that way everything is a little bit more secured. Uh, I have one that's being built right now that almost all of the uh, staging and everything is going on inside of the building, though the site is about three or four times the size of the building. But rather than, uh, you know, rather than deal with everything spread all over, they keep everything right inside the building, plus it's more secure. Uh, the soil, of course, when they're digging the footing and foundations and that, that's going to have to be removed immediately because there's no place to stockpile soil and that sort of stuff. Uh, but all of that can be dealt with uh, when we get a contractor and when we bid the project out to a contractor. If you have any requirements that you want the contractors to abide by, let us know and we'll make sure that that is part of uh, the bid specifications in their contract that they have to abide by that. Thank you for that clarification. Um, any other questions? Okay, since I hear none, um, I'm opening up to the members of the public. Is there any member of the public who wishes to ask a question of this witness? Uh, you'd have to, yes, you can, but you should come up here if you don't mind. Or there's also a microphone down there if you'd prefer. Sorry, thank you, Mike. <laughs> To the question about completing the second floor and having a full second floor, that was our original intent and our original goal was to have a whole second floor, but it was a budget issue. So uh, when we realized the height of the ambulances meant that the second floor would have to be a certain height, that would be cost prohibitive if we had the whole thing that high. So it could only do a lower, smaller portion and then uh, keep the bigger section open for the ambulances. So that was the answer to that. We would have loved to have a whole second floor. <laughs> Thank you. For the Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Any other questions for this witness from members of the public? Okay, hearing none. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Council, do you have any other witnesses? To uh, any other testimony? No, other than just to add, Mr. Chairman, we thank, of course, the board for the opportunity to present at this special meeting. As you know, this is a property that's in the redevelopment zone, central business district redevelopment area, and that's expressly permitted in the zone. And also just to remind this board, as you're aware, that the redevelopment plan actually specifically contemplates the relocation of uses to the extent necessary to fully implement the redevelopment plan. And in essence, that's what's happening here, whereas the rescue squad was, was formerly located at the, the Third and Valley area. And in essence, the, the developer, from what we understand, had the choice of either keeping us there or, or moving us and decided to uh, opt for the, for the latter. Also to remind the board that all the properties that, that surround, immediately surround our uh, property are, are similarly located within the redevelopment zone, even though we don't have a professional planner like we would. We believe that based on the, the testimony presented from the architect, from the engineer, and also the testimony presented by uh, Mr. Cohn, we do believe that the uh, proposal here this evening uh, promotes and meets the design standards and the requirements and planning objectives set forth in the redevelopment plan. We believe it enhances the property because obviously the property is currently a, a parking lot with no uh, improvement on it. We believe that it improves the visual streetscape uh, with an attractive building, and that's one of the, uh, the goals, the planning goals, certainly, of the redevelopment plan. We, at the same time, believe, specifically through the uh, testimony of the architect, that we're preserving the architectural integrity of the, uh, the firehouse next door. And we also believe that, based especially on the expertise of Mr. Connolly and the many uh, rescue squad and related projects he's worked on over the years that we're providing, in fact, an appropriate facility for the rescue squad equipment and the, uh, and the volunteers. In terms of its location in the downtown area, obviously it's located near the intersection of uh, major streets in the village of South Orange, allowing for easy, easy uh, regional travel, and that it's, uh, the, the rescue squad has actually been in this general area, as you heard from Mr. Cohen, for, for a long time, and it's obviously uh, 
the intent of the, uh, the trustee is to keep it in this uh, downtown area. And it's also when we do work on rescue squad, police and fire projects in downtown areas, um, it's always stated that it's a good location for them because it's near use that attracts a lot of people, whether it's you know, SOPAC right here, movie theater, train station, should patrons need assistance. And it also, as we hear from professional planners over the years with regard to emergency services, it also gives downtown patrons, especially seniors, even including in this case Seton Hall students right up the street, a sense of comfort knowing that if there's any health issues that the, uh, the rescue squad is uh, certainly right around the corner. We believe that we've uh, met the positive and negative criteria for the variance relief that's required. So there's, uh, as, as you know, uh, doing many applications over the years, there's uh, the C1 criteria and the C2 criteria. The C1 criteria talks about the uh, exceptional physical features uniquely affecting the specific piece of property or an extraordinary and exceptional uh, circumstance or situation uniquely affecting a specific spe uh, piece of property. In this case, you could make an argument certainly for a C1 considering the undersized uh, nature of the property and the great efforts that were made by Mr. Conley to still comply with the requirements uh, set forth in the, uh, in the redevelopment zone that we're in here. And that at the same time, it certainly meets the, uh, the negative criteria in terms of it will not be substantially detrimental to the surrounding area, especially considering the nature of the use, the firehouse use next, next door, and the fact that as testified by Mr. Ionelli, that the variances that we are seeking here are really in, in essence uh, de minimis. I mean, I do want to actually uh, cut myself off just for two seconds. If Mr. Ionelli has done any I think he's behind me to the right, any recalculation as to the uh, uh, impervious coverage just for purposes of, of any resolution. Uh, just to be safe, I assumed three three by three pads just to make sure that we have enough to cover it. Uh, and rounded that to 30 square feet, that would come out to 92.15% coverage. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ionelli. So that's, that's what's called the hardship variance under a C1 and a C2, which is the flexible C under the municipal land use law under section 70. Um, as referred to by uh, Mr. Dwyer uh, early on, um, there's really a four step process. The first step is of course, you look at the purposes of the municipal land use law. And in this case, the fact that as it was stated by Mr. Ionelli, it's an inherently beneficial use under 40 colon 55D dash uh, four of the municipal land use law by case law that basically meets the positive criteria for any type of variance relief, whether it's a C variance or whether it's a, whether it's a D variance. Notwithstanding that, it certainly meets a number of the, of the uh, purposes of the municipal land use law under section two, including promoting health, safety, and general welfare, providing adequate light, air, and open space, desir desirable visual uh, environment, and encourages coordination specifically in this case of private and public activities shaping land development. And as I stated with regard to the negative criteria, again, it's the same criteria, namely that this project we don't believe uh, provides any detriment, let alone any substantial detriment to the public or the uh, master plan or zoning ordinance other than the uh, deviations for which we're here for variance relief. Uh, we, it's a fully conforming plan. Uh, we've testified at length as to the uh, sufficiency of parking and the availability of parking in the surrounding area and that we believe that notwithstanding the fact that we know that every application, including ones that I've been part of, say that there's plenty of parking in the area. We do believe, especially considering the um, work that's being done on the uh, Third and Valley area, that there will be sufficient parking for, uh, for this proposed use, not only for visitors, but also for uh, members of the first aid squad. And therefore, we believe that whether it's a C1 or C2 criteria, that the applicant has met the applicable uh, positive and negative criteria, including the weighing of the positive and negatives under, uh, under the C2, and as a result, we respectfully ask that the minor site plan variance uh, application be uh, accepted and granted, and again, we thank you very much for taking the time this evening for hearing us at a special meeting. Okay. All right, with the, uh, the applicant being, uh, uh, having completed uh, providing testimony, uh, it's now time to open this up to the public. Uh, if there's any member of the public uh, here tonight who wishes to uh, say anything about this application, either for or against, uh, this would be the opportunity to do so. So it's now open to the public. 
and I don't want to rush anybody, but it doesn't seem like I see anybody uh, rushing themselves to come up. So I'm going to assume that there will there is no comment uh, from the public, uh, and therefore I'm going to close the uh, the public portion of this meeting. And now I'm going to leave it open to discussion from uh, my fellow members of the planning board. So, please. Well, uh, I uh, I think that. Uh, from a planning perspective, from a lot coverage perspective, um, I feel pretty comfortable of, of the use uh, that it's, a, it's certainly inherently beneficial. Um, my my only issues regard are regarding architectural, uh, and particularly a couple of issues: the design standards regarding the front elevation, uh, and that and also and the sign that I believe the sign's too large uh, for for this particular use. Um, as much as you know, it's it, that the sign. It, it as said as said here earlier, that it, it's it's not a destination for for people that need to know where where it is. I mean, it's really important when you call nine one one that they're close by, and that they can uh, respond quickly. Um, uh, the uh, an elevation D, as long as B also, but mostly D is, is just there's just it's completely featureless, and uh, and I understand that there may be some coverage from from trees, but like I said before, the overall architectural significance of this building, it, it's in a location that's very open and, and, uh, and noticeable. And so um, I, that would be my, cons my one concern is from an architectural standpoint. Okay. Other comments, questions? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I uh, second the Michael's sentiments. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. You know, it, it's unfortunate that the developer and the town did not agree to really enough money to build what the rescue squad wanted in the first place in the location that they wanted. But this is what we've got. I'm not opposed to the variances, but I'm not ready to give a stamp of approval until I get a commitment to do something on elevation D or the southwest side uh, and to do something with the front elevation with the sign in particular, which I think is just too immense, and to really commit to match as many of the elements of the firehouse next door, including the roll-up doors, which should not be a problem in terms of matching, uh, to make it look at least look like a similar building, even though it's a less costly building. I, keep, keep in mind, I mean, the town is losing 19 parking spaces that were revenue producing, but that, that's a town issue. Uh, I, I'm not getting into that. Uh, I, I'm all for it, providing uh, other the, most other criteria are met, and I don't know how to define it for the moment. Okay, uh, Lillian, did you want to? I have nothing, you know. In addition to add to that, I think we're in, I'm on the same page. My only comment, and again, this is a town follow-up, is to explore alternatives to the passenger pickup and drop-off because that's being eliminated right. as part of this, and I think that's going to impact commuters. Adam, did you want to add anything? You know, I, sh I share a lot of the similar concerns. I don't really have anything new to add. Um, yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, to be, and I'm sure you want to respond or add something, so just bear with me though for one second. I mean, un un unfortunately, the rescue squad has been sort of pushed into this position. They have very limited space to deal with. Right. They have very limited. They have a very limited budget. The amount of money they're being provided with is not adequate to provide that. And perhaps our responsibility doesn't really deal with finances, but we all know it. So I can't just sort of close our eyes and be, you know, and and, and wish it away. No. Um, so you know, having uh, I think the real question. Uh, in my mind, comes in. I mean, yes, there are certain things the township has to deal with, and I'm sure that the uh, one member of the uh, administration who is here uh, today uh, will take that back in terms of those drop-off spaces, what be done about that, and perhaps talking to the uh, 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 Jonathan Rose companies about perhaps setting aside a, a spot or two there um, and looking at other options. I'm, I'm sure they, if they're not already doing it, they'll certainly be doing it now. Um, the, the real question is how, how, how 
much we're going to uh, we want to make this a requirement as much as we want to make it a do the best you can given the resources that you have looking at looking at what's there I, I I don't I think all of us are I, well I won't speak for anybody else it sounds like uh, we might be in agreement that that there would be certain changes that would be beneficial for the way in which the building appears um, but I think some of it comes back to question of cost and and if we require it and the budget is there what are we consigning them to and if we I mean on the other side of the coin of course is if we make it a completely open-ended well do the best you can doing the best you can gives away any leverage meaning it, it basically says you're you know you could just say well we tried our best and whatever that was it didn't include any of those things you asked for so uh, you know unfortunately I think there has to be a, a certain choice that that we're going to make however since I see council back up here um, suffice it to say um, that I would be interested to hear of these various elements that we've asked about perhaps after talking about it out in the audience that maybe you have some thoughts about what you might be willing the rescue squad might be willing to commit to sure um, thank you for uh, for hearing me on this and and you are correct obviously you know we're incredibly constrained with a very limited budget um, that has resulted in, in going actually even to a number of different professionals <laughs> to try to, to to kind of squeeze this literally within the budget um, also to keep in mind that you know this is a unique applicant that we rarely ever see and that is a hundred percent volunteer applicant and not only a volunteer applicant who you know tries to do good, good for the community but is involved in you know the, the most worthwhile of projects you know saving saving human life and health and most if not all of them are residents of this community and what they want and I think you, you make a great point in terms of when you're driving by in the train and, and, and looking out you know they want to be proud of their building too you know, this is the building that they're going to put their name on, say, oh, look, I was part of the rescue squad at the time and a volunteer at the time when this building went up. So how do you, how do you balance that and obviously really wanting to do right for this community with what we're faced with in terms of financial constraints? You know, one of the things that we just talked about for a minute was the size of the sign. And certainly, as you heard from Mr. Connolly, we feel that the sign should be, you know, as big as possible, not just because we're, we're proud of the building, but also because of what the building represents. That being said, in terms of, you know, what you said as to, you know, do the best you can, we'll even go a step further and say certainly, um, I believe Mr. Connolly talked about the six by six foot sign, you know, is kind of shrinking it down and correspondingly shrinking down the lettering, even if you wanted to make it you know a tiny bit smaller though we don't we don't recommend that that's certainly something that you know we believe the board can you know state with specificity as to what the requirement is or a condition of approval what have you um, that the applicant would be willing to comply with but just please keep in mind the fact that we do believe that from uh, a rescue perspective that we you know do feel even having pedestrians kind of walking by or people coming off the train that we want to be as prominent as possible but of all, also as tasteful as possible obviously given the uh, the surrounding downtown area uh, with regard to elevation D you know certainly you know subject to what you all believe in the climbing plants and I know from other applications it's it's a problem for a whole host of reasons and you think it's a great idea and I used to be a chairman of a planning and zoning board and a lot of those end up blowing up in our faces for various reasons but we uh, would certainly commit to some sort of trellis detail obviously that we would submit maybe you know for the engineering department's review to something to you know if you like to make it look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing but we've already provided the testimony as to why you know we we believe that the the elevation D and the um, the facade there needs to look or, or, or be the way it is um, and finally as to comparing to the firehouse that's where we are uh, faced with the budgetary constraint and all we can do and we can you know commit as part of a condition of approval that we will endeavor to match as many of the elements of the firehouse as possible given our constraints and I think that the point was made and it was an excellent point that you know when in doubt to maybe put a little bit more towards the front versus versus the back where it's more 
uh, visible certainly to the community and that's something that the the applicant certainly as long as they uh, maintain the integrity of the the project and the design would be willing you know to do with, with certain elements I, I, don't know if, I don't know if that's helpful but I just wanted to ask you or ask the architect because I didn't see any uh, uh, on, the, on the shingles is it going to be dimensional shingles is it going to be flat the, the, the uh, roofing material since there's so much of it on the uh, on the shingles what we're looking at is for the most of the building will be dimensional shingles the you know the the 45 50 year old shingles and then on the tower itself we're looking to see if we can get one of the dimensional scout looking shingles but there's going to be asphalt shingles but we want to get something that looks a little bit nicer and a little bit more uh, like the area okay now thank you for that clarification appreciate it All right, well, I'm gathering this is the point in the meeting when we try and craft a resolution. I'll take a stab. I, if you would like, I, I'm yeah, always, I'll, always I'll move happy. approval of, of the application with the following provisos. A, the signage be reduced down so the emblem itself will not hang below the, call it the triangle part of the uh, facade on elevation A. Um, so that all of that would fit in, into there. B, that elevation D contain faux windows. Okay, I don't think the trellises will work. And, that, and C, that the roll-up doors match as closely as possible to that used on the firehouse. And that the color of the, I'll call it the faux brick or whatever you're using on the side that looks like brick, match as closely as possible to the firehouse I'm not sure if I agree with all of those okay I'm, yeah. just, I, I'm just proposing Let, let's get it I just want to hear a second to the resolution and then we can talk about amending it but I need a second first I would, I would second it okay now may, may I just add one thing um, I understand the building is very close to the firehouse but the architecture of this building is very different than the firehouse. You're, and trying to match the firehouse, I think, is a mistake. Because right, you're, right. you're, you're going to have a lot of difficulty because you're not going to be able to, you know, as they said, you're not going to have the, the, um, the, the sills that you have in the firehouse. You're not going to have the arches that you have over the doors. You're not going to have a slate roof like we do I on agree. the historic building. So I think trying too hard to match the firehouse might actually be a negative. I think it's you know it's good to try to keep it somewhat architecturally, you know, the same. But trying to match colors, trying to match things like that, I think it might be going in the wrong direction. I think you know this is its own building; it's not connected to the firehouse. Um, so I, I would just caution the board in trying to put restrictions like that on there. And then also your your recommendation for the sign, fitting it up into the triangular portion of there. I think the board needs to get a better handle on on a dimension. Well, um, again, you know, I can't you would mention be, it. What you would be to the willing to, I mean, you, know, you roughly know what the dimension is now. If you could give them an idea of uh, you know, how small you want the sign, I think that would be better than trying to craft a resolution <laughs> in that manner. All right, so Adam. Oh, and also the trellises. I'm sorry, one well, thing. Let me just, the, the, the trellis say, idea, there's only six inches of space between the building and the property line. It's going to be very difficult to maintain any type of you know, ornamental. Well, he didn't right. recommend a trellis. I'm not so. recommending the trellis. I'm, I'm against the trellis because you put I, something I, on. I the, put that forward earlier. Put he something on the trellis and it grows into the side of the building, and you got a maintenance issue. Yeah, which they can't. A get major there. maintenance issue. I, I, yeah. Okay, Adam. I'm sorry. You would. You wanted to. I just. I don't agree with the windows, uh, the wall, or I guess le leaving the wall. I think open at this. It, it's. Yes, not. I think that's our, I mean, for me, I think that's fine uh, with the architectural details they're adding into that wall already. The sign. Which, I'm sorry, which wall are you referring D, to? The, the trellis or the faux windows. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't think we should make that in, into a requirement. Um, mm -hmm. The sign on the front, yes, I would like to see it a little bit smaller, but not so small. I understand 
if you know a first first aid squad does want to have a you know, a, a very noticeable location, especially for volunteer efforts, and when we have when, you know they are responsible to continue that volunteer effort or people volunteering. I think having that across from a train station is actually pretty fantastic. And I think people looking down at something like that helps, you know, their recruitment. Um, and then the garage doors, I, as much as I would love to see some of the other architectural details, I think what they've put forward is, is a good effort. Would I like to see a little more? Yes. And, and as Michael said, if, if a little more money could be put, put up front, I think that would be fantastic. I think that if we start really telling them that these are the things we want, it really kind of puts them in a bad position. I'd like to expand on a little bit what Adam said here is that when we get, it's the danger is when we put on an architect's hat, and we're not architects. And so what we try to do is we're trying to solve the problem. We're really here to bring up issues that maybe can be solved by whether it be an architect or an engineer, not come up with the solution. We recognize that that big wall needs something. It needs to be addressed somehow. We've come up with a trellis. We've come up with mm -hmm. faux windows. We're not architects. We're, you know, we stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night, but we're not architects. You know, so we're, uh, we'd like to, if you can come up with something, you know, that's, that's why you know, you're here. But um, as for the sign, I think if we can quantify that with a certain size, as opposed to a location, just come up with a size that, you know, some, some reasonable si size that we, the, the sign here on, in the Spring Lake looked like it was around five feet or so. Uh, you know, that's probably more appropriate for this, the size of the front. Yeah, I, can, can I just comment? I, I think that Mr. Conley testified earlier that he believed that that was approximately what, six by. I think that was a six by six sign, and I think cutting it down by six by six, I think with that in the lettering, I think six. we can probably get underneath your ordinance and, and shrink that down a little bit. The other comment I want to make just in terms of the sign and the size of the sign is that it's very, very important just talking to the rescue squad members that the South Orange Rescue Squad name actually be as part of the sign. And the concern when I heard in terms of just shrinking it down so it's kind of above the, the triangle, so to speak, is that it may force the letters out, so to, so to speak, and then there wouldn't be any room for them. So well, Let me quantify it and yeah. say five by five. You asked, you asked me to give you a number. Yeah, well, give okay. a number, five mm -hmm. by five. Mm -hmm. I, I would say yes, as long as we're not shrinking the letters down to the point where they're, they're I, I, you know, I right just, now we're at nine inch letters. I don't really want to go smaller I'm than that as long as you, you, you don't have to shoot, shrink the letters if you just you know, shrink the, you know, the, the emblem. You know, the letters could be sure. the same sure. size. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Sure. Um, we're not asking for that. I mean, it's just it's just a scale. Mm -hmm. You know, Correct. I'm not saying don't make it legible. I was not personally. I don't think. I mean, keep the letters as big as as reasonable. Uh, I, I was thinking if we made the star of life down five by five, then all the letters would have to be brought in. Also, I didn't but say if we could leave know. the letters out there and just make the star of life smaller. I have no problem with that. That just that's okay. Fine. Thank you. I don't um, understand what that means. What it means is, is that they're going to retain it being about the same size as a rectangle, but they're going to actually decrease the size of the Star of Life, if I heard that correctly. Well, so that the, the emblem in the middle is shrinking, but the letters on the outside are remaining of approximately the same with, size we've been discussing. Go with ahead, with the one caveat that we would shrink the overall, including the lettering, based on the, the rectangle definition of the ordinance below the 95 square feet. Well, right. Yeah. The applicant agreed to comply with the ordinance. Okay. Well, no, because the ordinance might permit the size of the, the emblem. I just think it's just out of proportion to what you're trying to All right. do. I'm, I'm, we, 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 would, we would be willing just so we're, oh, sorry. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to ask clarification. Are you suggesting the planning board doesn't have the authority to go to, to uh, require they, anything beyond? Unless they stipulate otherwise. But they are stipulating otherwise. It's what I think I'm hearing. So, Well, I mean, the reality is that even though if you're, we feel that even though if we're fully complying with a particular condition, if based on the, the good comments of the planning board, and obviously for the benefit of this community that they want us to look at an alternative, we're willing to do that, and I believe that that's what we're stipulating too. So namely, we would, although stay within the 95 square feet in terms of the rectangle per se, that in terms of the, uh, the emblem, that we would shrink that down. 
as testified to, but while maintaining the, the lettering as close to what, what was originally proposed. Yeah, I don't have a problem with the letter scale. Okay. So, okay. So under 95 square feet, which is the ordinance requirement in terms of the rectangular uh, scope uh, area, but that the emblem would be smaller than presently in shown in the ground shift. Correct. That a fair restatement? That's a fair statement, yes. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just because I know we're going to craft, we're going to work on crafting the resolution a little bit more. Did, did we say, I, I just want to remember if we said, was that six by six or five by, I just trying to remember if I heard something specific or I'm if, the one if that said five by I'm five. just, if there's nothing specific and that's the extent yeah, of I, it, I think, then that's fine. I think fine. The, uh, the, the testimony earlier from Mr. Connolly was that uh, six, he, he felt based on also the A3 that the six by six would be appropriate while shrinking it down, but. Okay, I, I mean, I don't have to put it in there. I'm mm -hmm. just trying to make sure if it, if we had, I'm just trying to make sure, I'm, I'm trying to write down so we make sure we get in the resolution what we want to be in the resolution. I, I'm just going to, just amongst ourselves here, among the planning board members, I'm going to see if I can tackle or not to restate the resolution. While you're tackling it, maybe we can get the exact, if the architect can just sit down for a second and just give us what no, sizes I, will be, what I, I, I don't, put it in. I, I, yeah, I, I personally, yeah. here's my opinion on that, Michael. I think that what, We've just discussed, I mean, I personally think that it's acceptable as is, meaning they're going to comply with the ordinance. They've agreed to reduce, this, to reduce the size of the emblem. You know, I, I, I don't know how much more specific you want to get. I, I want to know what size they're going to reduce the emblem to. Is it a one inch, two feet, what? And, and uh, that's why I've asked the architect to look at it. He can scale it a lot quicker than I can. Let me ask you this question just to play devil's advocate. So what if he came back and he says it's going to be 18 inches? Will that be acceptable to you? I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, it's I don't of, be, to me, it's out of scale on the building now. Let him come down to something that's what in is, scale. What is in scale? I mean, he could say, we could come back and say three inches is in scale. Is that going to be in scale for you? I, I don't mean to be difficult. I'm just trying to say, I have no way of knowing that. Okay. So I'm just, just hey, bear hey, with let me Mr. Connolly. Sure. How about if we say that it will be no larger than six foot by six foot? But We'll shrink it down, but it'll be no larger than six foot by six foot. It, it doesn't matter. I, I have no way of judging that. So if you do, Michael, I'm. I'm well, I can just do a six foot by six foot square with a scale. Ooh. Well, it shrinks it about uh, 18 inches on the on the height and, a, and 11 inches on the width. Yeah. So that's what you're talking about. Okay. 18 inches on the height. It, it lacks context for me, so it's, no, I it, it. I, I'm not, not, that sounds good. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I it, would, it would keep the, the letters the same, and it just reduces the size of the emblem. So if that's what you're trying to do. Yes. Well, we'd also, I guess, reduce the, uh, yeah. the lettering maybe somewhat, but not significantly. Well, but how, how, are we gonna dress, how are we going to address the sign? Well, we, we just, we just, I think you just, I think you just got your answer, which is, it's, it's, again, it's going to be compliant with the ordinance, which means that it has to, at a minimum, be under 95 square feet no, 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 in I area. Know, I, the, I, side, I, the side, I, I, the side, the side, the side. How are you going to address the side issue? We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. I'm just dealing with one thing at a time. Uh, the, the, and that the emblem will be no no larger than six by six correct the letters will be of corresponding size and i really don't want to get into the size of the letters thank you okay so we have three other as far as i have heard i hear i think i hear we had three other issues there's elevation d there's the 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 doors and their appearance and then there is the area at the top of where the sign is those are the three areas that three other areas that Michael, you addressed, and that I've heard us discuss. In terms of elevation D, the blank wall, we've heard we heard testimony from the architect in terms of the faux windows that he indicated that there was a concern, which relates to it being a uh, relating to a seismic wall or what have you. So I, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things that we could do, I was looking at faux windows as in making them actually like you infill the window. So you're sticking the block in a couple of inches. 
if we just change the color of the block, if that would be acceptable, we could do you know two windows on the top, two just different color block. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's you what you're just different for. color block squares? No, what we would have to do is we would have to end up, the, the block is 16 <coughs> inches by, yeah. so what we would do is we would end up picking, you know, maybe a, a three foot or a four foot, and we would end up running two cores a block and then cut them and do it in a different color to make it look like, yeah, squares, rectangles, no, that's same not size right. as the that's windows. That, that's not what I'm looking at, sir. So, Mr. Connolly, that's not what so, I'm looking for. What do you See, mean we by have an windows? ordinance that basically says in this in this zone you can't have you shouldn't have a block a blank wall. All right, you have a blank wall. You're asking for all kinds of variances, and all I'm saying is to accommodate that, put up some faux windows. But what what do you consider a faux window? That to me, that's a faux a window. A thing that looks like a window, but is is obviously is not operative. Uh, but it, we can't. This needs to be a a rated wall that needs to have three or four hour fire rating, yeah. which you can only get with a masonry wall that is eight inches thick or thicker. So basically what, if I was to take an opening in that wall and put a window in there and put a piece of plywood behind it so it looked like a window, that's not meeting the code. The construction code is that that needs to be a non-combustible surface and a masonry surface. So when you were talking about fell windows, I had in my mind going from an eight inch thick block to a four or six inch thick block and an infill of what looks like it used to be a window um, or do, doing multiple colors. But putting a fake window there uh, w will not make, make the code. Well, then do something, come up with some scheme that's presentable. And I not feel that we've done that. Look, unless, with our unless, unless, well, okay. We are not, I think the goal would be not to have to have another meeting to address this. So we're not going to add, if that is the case, obviously we're, the architect's not going to leave this room and come up with, with a new scheme that we're going to find to be acceptable. Obviously, uh, the, obviously we're looking for something more than just different colored brick. Um, at the same time, we understand the point that you're making about um, the concerns about having, for example, a faux window. You could forget the trellis idea, or I understand the concern about vines. It was just something I was, you know, off the top of my head. I, I think that on this case, I'm going to suggest we have to, if we want to complete this meeting tonight, I'm going to suggest that we just go a little bit on faith here and suggest that or make as a part of our resolution that they will, to the best of their abilities, incorporate any architectural features that can possibly be incorporated into Elevation D. Uh, that is where, that is what I, it's not my resolution at the moment. There is a resolution proposed. That's not a part of the resolution. That is what, that is what I would propose. In terms of, in terms of matching the doors, so I'm just going to keep you know, going through this. In terms, of, in terms of matching the doors, I think we already heard the uh, architect uh, comment that uh, if it was at all possible, I think the big issue was the windows in particular, and that if it was possible that they would make changes to the windows to make it more attractive and more in line with the um, fire, uh, with the fire station. And then finally, as it relates to matching the brick, again, I want to go back to what we said earlier about recognizing there is a cost factor here. We're balancing it against the aesthetic. Insofar as you can find other ways, and this is not going to be incorporated in this way into the resolution, but insofar as you can find ways to save money in whatever other areas of the, you know, you can within reason that you would devote, that you will do what you can to rather than use stucco on the upper portion of that area, that you would instead incorporate the, the brick that would make it more attractive. Um, I'm, I'm willing, given, given the constraints given to the South Orange Rescue Squad, budgetary, space-wise, 
and all that they're going through, I'm willing to go on a little faith here, knowing that they'll do their best. This is a community they live in. They're going to want to do what they can. They've heard what the planning board has to say. The architect has heard what we have to say. The attorney has heard what we have to say. They've, they've, they're definitely hearing us loud and clear. And I would recommend, it's my personal opinion, I'm not, you know, I can't, I'm just, I mean, even on the chair, I can't tell anybody here what to do. My recommendation would be that we amend the resolution to incorporate the things that I just mentioned. I should add that we do need to uh, acknowledge that there are variances that are being requested and they have to actually be specifically acknowledged, mm -hmm. which have to do with uh, lot coverage, they have to do with lot size, and now that also has to do with the lot, uh, and the lot coverage, by the way, has now been updated so that it's from 90% is permitted and 92.15% is what the engineer told us. So those would have to be also incorporated into the, um, uh, into the um, uh, resolution as well. That would be my recommendation for an amendment to the resolution, but I can only do that if the person who made the resolution and the person who seconded the resolution are willing to do that. Otherwise, we have to vote on the resolution as presented. So, Michael, and Michael, that's in your, those, it's in your hands. You can decide what to do or, or whether we're going to vote on what was put forward earlier. I'll withdraw the resolution. I'll withdraw my original resolution. Okay. That way you don't have to amend it. Okay. But, but again, you know, you want to go on faith. Um, and, and, I, and I accept some of that. But I see no reason why this board couldn't approve the plans because they've, they've got to start working drawings anyway. And the changes that we're talking about to use their terms on the variances. The variances are, are disma, de minimis, and so are the changes that we're recommending. I don't see any reason why the architect can't come back with a, just a simple elevation for us to, to look at on, the, on, on section elevation D and the changes on the doors. I, I don't see any reason why they can't me, do that. Let me ask a question. I mean, we still can I, approve the resolution so it doesn't delay working drawings and everything else. Let me ask, let me ask a question. Um, I, I, Sal, I'm, this, I, I, I'm not sure if I should direct this question to you, but this is the best guess I have that you would be the most helpful in answering this. We are going to vote on this resolution tonight, hopefully, and at our next meeting, we would actually, the September meeting, assuming that, you know, council can get the resolution, you know, written up, we would actually vote on that. Um, and we've heard that um, the applicant wishes to move forward in the fall, which unfortunately starts in just a few weeks. Um, so my question is, Let's assume that we take what Michael is saying, Miller is saying at face, you know, saying at his face. Is there an opportunity for this board to, if we approve a resolution tonight and the and the and and then we vote on the resolution formally pass it in the September meeting, is there an opportunity uh, for us to see anything else that we can? give our opinion on, or once we've voted on the resolution tonight, it's all said and done. Well, the board has the authority to delegate some of its responsibility for things like design concerns and often does allow, and does pass resolutions which say certain part of it will be subject to review and approval of the board engineer or the board planner. Um, as we know, there is no board architect. Um, sometimes the uh, board has relied upon uh, the civic committee, which is now known as the, what's it called? Now, Sal? Have, they, have they looked at this design? Sal, what's the, lo what's, it was, used to be Main that, Street. That, that, you mean the Village Alliance? Alliance? Used to be Main Street. What's it called now? The Village Alliance. Oh, Alliance. Village, Alliance. yeah, Village Center. Alliance. Sometimes the board has asked them to review the plans and make recommendations. Uh, but the board has some limited authority to delegate and has done that in the past. But it could not, but but it could not come back to this board. It, once it's passed, well, it's, it's passed. question, I'm sorry. Right. Once it's passed, it's passed. Right, that's what I thought. I have so, confidence it going to. I mean, I have definitely. I I'm, I'm, I'm trying to split this hair as much as I can, okay? I, I understand. So, so 
Ostensibly, we could do these subject to review by, I know you love it when we do this, but subject to your review that it complies with what we've been asking for. Meaning, for example, elevation D were to incorporate an, you know, architectural features. You could review that to see, they would come back to you, you could review that and say whether or not they have, in fact, done what we requested. Um, well, that's a pretty gray area, because what architectural features are you talking about? Because, uh, you know, you're, you know, you, you've, you've spoken about a couple of different options, which don't seem feasible. Right. Um, you know, if, if you're going to leave, you know, quite honestly, it, it's not like measuring the size of the sign to see if it's going to conform to the ordinance. It's, I, this is completely different. I know. And this is very... You, you and I have been in enough meetings that I kind of knew what your response was going to be, but I figured I had to ask the you question. You could also come back to the site plan committee of this board. Can it? it? Board hasn't in the past relied upon that committee in that way, but there is no reason why it couldn't. But does the but once the application is approved, how you know again how much power can you give the site plan committee in you know denying the applicant from moving forward with? Let me the ask, can I ask the applicant a question? Would the applicant be willing to uh, use its best efforts to? Uh, if not comply with, at least attempt to incorporate into the design some of the uh, questions and, and characteristics that have been raised. Absolutely, and I just want to um, thank you, Mr. Dwyer. I just want to also add that, as you heard from some of the uh, colloquy back and forth in terms of what we want to try to do for the community, um, a lot of it will depend in part on, you know, what I'll call, for lack of a better term, is value engineering and trying to, you know, put our best foot forward so that the, the building looks, you know, just generally as good as possible for, for the community. And the, the problem is that when you have, and we've learned this, unfortunately, the hard way, subject to review by the engineer or the planner, let's say after the fact, that when we'll get bids on a project, the contractor will say, well, look, you know, we could save some money if we do this over here, we can do this over here, and then we can add, you know, this to elevation D. So unfortunately, a lot of that, that good work comes not necessarily within even a two-week time period or a 30-day time period between the, the vote of approval and the adoption of the resolution, but it comes thereafter. Certainly, I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Mr. Dwyer's statement, and certainly we would continue to work with the, uh, with the engineering department in any event. Councilor, I thought this building was value engineered. I thought the, tr the town trustees, when they wanted to reduce the, or, or get the numbers kind of down, they, they went to value engineering and looked at this from a value engineering standpoint. We, we absolutely have, but what I'm saying is that based on the comments of, of the planning board, that if the board wants us to take a look at, you know, changing a certain element here and there and where where will that change in terms of the numbers? And certainly we're willing to look at that. We just want to you know, put forth the best building possible for the community. And we believe that we've done that with regard to the plans. And we're willing to comply and do the very best we possibly can to incorporate as many architectural well, elements as again, possible. Again, the concern I have is we have two, we have residences next door facing elevation D. For however long they're going to be there, I have no idea. Uh, some of those trees that are, going, are there now are going to be removed. Some of the trees, by your people's testimony, your expert testimony, that overhang will have to be trimmed. So obviously those buildings or wherever are going to face onto that blank wall. Architect you our ordinance that talks about down in that development, it should not be a blank wall. So it hasn't been addressed. I think it should have been addressed. And now we're faced with a dilemma of addressing it. And you know, counting on somebody to say, well, we'll use our best efforts. Well, best efforts is a term of art that gets people into court, and I'm not looking to do that. So I, I need a commitment from your team to do something on that blank wall that it's not going to be blank and is in keeping with our ordinance. Talking to the microphone, please. If we were to bring this block down the bottom, 
up higher or do something with that where it comes up and then maybe it goes back down and up, something like that, just break up the color. Would that be acceptable? Better, sir, for the moment, well, right. But the what moment. we're talking about, but what we're talking about is for you're, this you're neighbor. About a wall, it's two stories. I high. think, All right. If it uh, look, you're doing the best you can under the circumstances. Sure. I get. I get it, it, w look. What Mr. Miller is asking for is not changing the color of the blocks. I'm not agreeing well, per se with Mr. Miller. I'm just translating no. here. So, no, so, so my point is, the color, is that the color, the texture, and the depth of the block. Right now this block here is a split face block. It's a rough face block. It's sticking out four inches further. It's, I mean, other than, than that, that needs to be a masonry wall for code reasons. So, so you can't agree to it is what you're saying. Anything which would, ha which would actually reduce the thickness of the wall any architectural feature would, and I'm assuming what you're saying is any architectural feature will, by definition, reduce the thickness of the wall. Uh, unless we were to apply something onto that wall, take a piece of trim to make it you know, look like there was a window there, take a piece of Phipon or a piece of pediment and basically, okay. for lack of a better term, glue it onto the wall. I, I, I think you're saying, you know, it, it's, it's not, it, she, it, we put them on the spot. He's got right. zero time in order to figure something right. out now. It, it's so it's a little unfair. Yeah. Um, I don't. I want to be able to vote on this tonight. I think it's too important to, to put off. Right. But that's why we're talking about splitting this hair here. And right. I think, given a little more time, I think uh, Mr. Connolly's going to come up with something right. a little better than what yeah. he's just you know spitballing right now. If he puts you know pencil and paper. I know right. he can. Um, I don't, how do we quantify that? How do we, how do we memorialize that? I, 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 I don't think we can probably do much more than what I was offering earlier. I, I, the, the, I, I do want to just in fairness to Mr. Miller, I want to point out that, that what ha what's happened here is that the onus has been shifted from the applicant to the board yeah. in terms of being responsible for, see, the, when, you, when you put forward the proposal and you saw that there was something that was not in line with what was, what was written out in the ordinance and when you got a comment from the planner as it, you know, as it addressed this point, it would have, it, it, you're, you're coming in here one applicant one time. We deal with this a little bit more frequently and it gets frustrating when we are put in the position of saying, well, we don't want to be, you know, and especially in this case, we certainly don't want to be, uh, 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 you know, want to, want to delay the applicant in any way, make, pay for professionals to come back, all those other things. We wanted to get the project done, they're in this place that they shouldn't be in, all of these things. It would have been better had th there been a response to this particular question which was raised in advance, and that's the frustration. Having said that, now it's out, the catharsis is there, we've said what we have to say, here we are, and we have to deal with it. So that's the frustration, but having said that, because we have to deal with it, the best thing that we're gonna be able to do, as Mr. Lehrman said, as, and as I was suggesting earlier, is to show a little faith and to rely upon the expertise. That is my opinion, obviously, Mr. Miller has withdrawn his resolution. In a moment, I suspect I'm going to make a resolution along the lines of what I just said a moment ago. And then if there's a second, I would suspect we would move on to a vote and hopefully be able to put this behind us um, and for you to be able to move forward. But we are counting on you, assuming we do approve the resolution, to do what, we just, what we're talking about right now. So, and if you're hearing some frustration, and I will, uh, Admit that I share Mr. Miller's frustration to a limited, ex at least to a certain extent. That's why. Okay. So there's no there's no reason to go any further. We've beaten this horse to death and then some. So, so I suspect we should we should really move on. If the board will indulge me, I will make a resolution then, uh, which was basically along the lines of what I suggested before. The resolution being that that we approve the site plan as presented this evening, uh, as requested, with 
um, variances for um, lot coverage with the adjusted percentage that the uh, permitted is 90 percent and the lot coverage is at 92.15 percent that we also provide the permit that that we also approve the variance for the relief in terms of the lot uh, size and that we approve the relief for the minimum rear yard setback that was requested um, and that we do so with the following caveats um, and comments that the signage be total size that, uh, under 95 square feet in terms of the rectangular area which will be compliant with the current code that there will be an emblem that will be no larger than six feet by six feet and you'll set the size of the letters accordingly that for elevation D that you will make the applicant will make its best efforts to include architectural features to break up the wall and to break up the wall as best they can that in terms of the doors on the, uh, to the bays that you will do your best to match the features of the doors of the firehouse specifically relating to the windows and that as it relates to the um, brick or the block um, in the um, behind where the emblem is that rather than having stucco that you will make your best efforts to make that block similar to the rest of the front uh, facade. That is, that is the resolution that I, that, I, uh, that I think takes into account all of the features we discussed. Um, and I'd be looking for a second for that resolution. Second. Okay, so we have a second from Lillian. Is there, is any, any further discussion? Okay, so Jetta, can you please uh, call the roll? Mr. Lerman? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Lerner? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. And Mr. Coldemax? Yes. So the resolution has been approved. Uh, we will be taking a final, after, you know, we have to take our final vote at the next uh, meeting of the board, which will be uh, in September. Um, I, I just want to say that you, Council, have thanked us uh, more than once for taking the time. Actually, I think, quite frankly, we should be the ones thanking. There are a number of members of the South Orange Rescue Squad who have come out and sat through all of this, but um, I want to take the opportunity on behalf of this board. I don't think I'd be out of line in speaking for all of us, as well as the professionals and staff in thanking you for all the hard work you do. And it's really um, uh, glad, glad we can at least play this very small role in getting you just a little bit closer to uh, a better home. So thank you and, and uh, God bless and keep doing the good work you're doing. And since there's no other business before this board, I'm gonna call the meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.